What's up, Sandy? How are you doing? What's up, Eli? Hey, Kellogg. Hey, where were you Sunday? I was worried. Um, oh, did, did I? I don't. I don't think I said I was going to go live on Sunday. Did I? Um, I, I went to church on Sunday, so that was nice. <laughs> Sorry if you thought I was going live. I don't think I said I was going live. I think I might have said maybe if I had time. I didn't have time. Hello, Kellogg. Yes. Oh, sorry about that, Michelle. That's probably my fault. Um, but I'm here now. We're good. Hello, Amber. How are you guys doing? Hopefully everybody's doing well. Went through, man, Romans is just such a crazy book. <laughs> glad not glassy. Um, Glad that I'm glad that you're okay. <laughs> I'm glad too. I am. I'm glassy as well. <clears throat> um, but yeah, no, I, I uh, didn't have time on Sunday, or else I would. But I have time now. So hopefully, hi from Texas. What's up, Babs? Hey, Gail. How are you? Glad you guys are with us. Um. Hi from Texas. What time is it in Texas? It's it's got to be like what, like ten o'clock, ten forty-five ish, or so. Um, I miss some Texas weather. Uh, I uh, <laughs> also, where at in Texas are you from? Are you getting are you getting overrun by? Oh man, what is happening to our country right now? Eleven forty-five. What's up, Yogi? How are you doing? I like that name, Yogi. That reminds me, there was a there was a pastor. My our best friends, they had a pastor who passed away, and his name was actually Yogi. So that was their favorite pastor. They talked about him all the time. I never got to meet him, but every time I hear Yogi now, I think of that guy, that pastor. But what's up, Holly? How are you? Um, we'll we'll go ahead and get on. We'll get started here in just a minute. I figured we would let people join for another minute or two, and then we can start with the recap of Romans. Um, I don't know if you guys have been reading. Have you guys been reading at all? Uh, close to about two hours from Dallas. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I I was in El Paso for a couple of years. Never made it to Dallas. I drove through, um, but. No, no stories there for me, um, but I, I, I did enjoy Texas. Katie, hello, good evening, Ryan, and all. So happy to be here. <laughs> did, did you get a nap? Did you get a nap in? I know you said you were trying to get a nap so that you could stay up for this one. <laughs> oh man, love Romans. No kidding. Oh, it is. Uh, it's a good book, man. It is such a good book, and there's so many layers to it. I'm telling you what, I'm just, tr like, my head is spinning half the time when I'm trying to maintain things, but uh, thanks for being here, Katie. Hopefully, hopefully you're you're uh, well-rested and ready to go. I did, yay! <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, what's up, Michelle? Are you at work? <laughs> Hopefully, uh, if you are at work, then hopefully, hopefully things are going okay. I know uh, if you're if you're hanging out here while you're at work, hopefully we can make some time the time go by faster for you, which is the the goal here. You're not what? Uh, I needed a nap, but I'm going to power through it. Let's go. Have you have you been here, Yogi? Have you been here before? Have you been lurking in the background? Because I I swear I would have remembered that name. Uh, what's up, Alyssa? Hi. I actually saw that you just joined, and I was about to say uh, hello. Thanks for being here, Alyssa. Um, guys, keep Deidre in your prayers still. She's recovering from her heart surgery. And um, keep Chris in your prayers as well, uh, also, because he, uh, I think, 
he, he, he sent me a message and I didn't actually click on it because I was already running behind. But the six words I was able to see was that I think he's out of the hospital, but I'm not sure. So regardless, keep him in your prayers. Um, I'll have to read that message when I get done with this live. If I have time, I just have been trying to, I've been all over the place. So haven't had time. Yeah. Keep Deidre. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I lurk, but mostly listen on YouTube. Oh, that's so cool. Um, I, yeah, if you guys are interested in the YouTube, um, like Yogi listens to it uh, from what she just said, uh, there's a link inside the profile. If you guys are interested in, uh, I always upload these videos on YouTube. So they are there. If you would like, sheesh, what's up, Brando? What's up, man? How are you? Good evening. Great to be here. Love for all. Yeah. Thanks for being here. So shocking that I'm not. I'm so glad to be when I can really pay attention. That is so cool. Um, Brando, um, yeah, man. <laughs> Your response killed me when I told you that I was thinking, I was like, Hey, I can talk on Melchizedek because I love talking on Melchizedek. Uh, I just, I mean, if you guys have been here at all, you guys know that already, but, um, I figured that would be a good one if that works for you, but you know, I'm down for whatever you would like to do. So, um, you're, you're the boss. So you tell me what, um, is okay and how long it needs to be or whatever. And, uh, I am down for it. Um, but we can go ahead and get on in. Um, if you guys, I said this before, but if you guys have not followed this guy, you guys should go follow him because he puts out some solid content. Uh, and he's a wizard of TikTok. <laughs> he, I want to be like him when I grow up. Give me your pitch, LOL. Oh, man. Talking about Melchizedek. <laughs> <laughs> where do you start? I mean, Genesis 14, you know, he's talking, Abraham gives tithes to Melchizedek and, uh, he, which, you know, says, says a lot about that because who Abraham is the father, right? So the father Abraham, but now you're introduced to a guy named Melchizedek who Abraham is giving tithes to. So it shows that Abraham was subordinate to Melchizedek. And then, you know, that you unpack that a, a lot in the book of Hebrews. Um, but Melchizedek, you learn about him. He is a king and a priest, whereas there's a whole bunch of kings. There's a whole bunch of priests, but there's only three people who are kings and priests. And Melchizedek is the first king and priest that we are introduced to. And then after him, Jesus is a king and priest. And then after Jesus, the bride or the church, you and I, if you're a Christian, we are also kings and priests because that's what First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 talks about. So you have three people who are kings and priests. And those are very significant. That's a very significant title and something to uh, pay attention to because that will pay, play a huge part uh, when you get to Revelation chapter 5 because the 24 elders that are in heaven before the seals are broken refer to themselves as kings and priests. And that is so stinking cool when you like connect those dots. Um, and that's one of my main reasons why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. So, you know, there's that. Um, hello, good morning. Carly, hello. Uh, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> I know. Um, I remember the, I remember the study of revelation. Yeah. See Katie, um, Katie, Katie, uh, it's always fun talking to Katie because I think she's kind of teeter tottering on where she lands as far as does she believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, mid-trib or post-trib, you know, cause there's a lot of people who have different ideas. Um, but it's always good to have those conversations and, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's good to, talk on these things and to unpack them because, you know, in Acts 17, 11, it says that these were more fair minded than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. And that's something that I've been challenging myself on uh, lately in case you guys were wondering, because I, uh, there's been things that I've been taught my entire life and I just, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm maintaining a lot of those, um, those teachings. However, I'm revisiting those teachings with fresh eyes because, you know, that's a challenge that we are given, you know? So I think it's important to do that and unpack because, you know, you, you might know what you, uh, you were taught, but there's a whole different level of understanding that you are able to glean. If you unpack those things for yourself, like if you know something in the Bible, you know, that you're saved through grace for by grace, are you saved through faith? Like, that's really good. 
But then when you start studying why that is and unpack it, then you learn it for yourself. Now you're just getting a whole bunch of insight and you're holding on to that for you. And then you can give that to somebody else. Whereas, you know, it doesn't come across as the same when, you know, you, you just tell somebody what you were taught because you don't really understand the whole background of it. So, um, and I also want to be you and I grow up, but I don't think I'll ever grow up. No kidding. What's up, Heather? Heather is all over the place. Uh, Ren, good to see you. Jessica, we are saved by baptism. Sheesh, negative. Um, I highly disagree with that. Okay, we can go ahead and dive into the book of Romans. We can go ahead and get started um, because we got some stuff to cover tonight. Thanks for being here, guys. My name is Ryan. I uh, we, We've been going through a whole bunch of books, and we've been doing it expositionally, and that just means verse by verse. <laughs> um, we're going through a verse by verse. So it's, it's really cool. Um, I'm talking about these types of things. Um, and, and unpacking them. Uh, and so that's, that's the hope that we're trying to do tonight. So if you have been here before, cool. If not, then I want you to know that the one thing that I, uh, you know, you can disagree with me on some things, but I want you to know that there's one thing that we can't disagree on. And that is how to know for sure you can get to heaven. There's only, only one way to know for sure that you can get to heaven. There's only one way to heaven. And that is by putting your faith in and what Jesus did for you on the cross. What did Jesus, who is Jesus? Jesus is God's son. He was born. He led a sinless life. He died on the cross for your sins, for my sins. He was buried and he rose again on the third day. And the Bible says, for whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's it. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 also amplifies that. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I mean, John 3, 16, you can just keep on going. Um, but that is what I want you to understand more than anything. You can disagree with me on some of the stuff that we're talking about tonight. That is completely okay. Um, however, that issue right there is something that I will never budge on and I will die on that hill. Um, so I want you guys to know that more than anything else. So um, if we are saved by physical water, we best never inhabit... <laughs> Uh, Mars folks. <laughs> um, all right. So w let's dive into the book of Romans. Um, just so you guys know, um, we, all of these videos, I just uh, upload onto YouTube. If you, so if you are interested, you can click on my little TikTok profile picture here. And um, if you go there, there's a little YouTube link and it'll take you to YouTube and you can go through all the other studies that we went through before. And we do a pretty good job unpacking a lot of the things. We don't hit everything, but, you know, I give you what I got. But we went through Revelation. We went through Daniel, Ruth, John, Hebrews, James, Acts. And now we're going through the book of Romans. So, hey, thanks, Yogi. I appreciate that. So those are there if you guys are interested in going through it. Um, those are some good books. And now we are in Romans. But I always I think it's important to uh, we always do a recap before we start diving into what we're going to get into. And so tonight we're going to get into chapters three and chapter four. But before we do, I want you guys to understand a little bit of background. So we are um, thanks, Bridget. <laughs> we are going through the book of Romans and Paul is the one who actually ends up writing the book of Romans. Thank you guys. Thanks, Michelle. So Paul writes the book of Romans and we, you know, this just works out so beautifully because we just finished the book of uh, Acts, the, the Acts of the Apostles. And so we unpacked a lot of the things that happened in the Acts of the Apostles. And that leads us almost, it's a, it's a natural continuation from the, the, the Acts of the Apostles straight into the book of Romans. Um, some people refer to the book of Romans as the gospel according to Paul, because Paul just unpacks it in such a beautiful way. It's such elegant. Hey, thank you, Heather. Man, you guys, um, evening. Hi, Cecilia. Thank you guys. Um, but Paul unpacks it in such an elegant way. And it's so neat because this piece of, um, literature is unlike so many other writings. This is a highly revered, uh, piece of art in a sense, just because of how well it is written. We need to remember who Paul is though. Okay. So, um, and this is just, this is just good information to have because it will help you, um, 
uh, kind of get an idea about who you're dealing with as the author. So Paul is the one who wrote, wrote this book. But in the book of Acts, we learn that Paul studied under a guy named Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the top dog during their time. And Paul was being tutored by him. So he was like, he was right. He was his right hand man. He was learning directly from Gamaliel himself. And so what I want you to think of when you think of Paul, I want you to think of Paul as a type of Socrates or Plato or Aristotle or those types of guys. Paul was so high up there. He was highly, highly, highly educated on different levels that you and I can really fully grasp because, I mean, and you you pick up on those types of things because he's highly educated in Hebrew um, and Greek. He quotes uh, poets. He, he does all kinds of philosophical like types of reasoning and thought processes that he introduces to you in his Pauline epistles and whatnot. And so he is a genius. This guy is such a genius. It's unbelievable. So that's important to understand that. It's also good to know that Paul, his ministry was directly um, uh, uh, aimed towards the Gentiles. He wanted to go and track down the Jews and give the Jewish people the gospel because he had such a heart for them. And every time he would reach out, he would reach out, he would reach out to the Jewish people. He would basically get beat up or stoned and then carried out, thrown outside the city and whatnot. Um, and so he eventually turns from them and he's like, you know what, I'm going to the Gentiles, which is what God had in, in, line, in store for him all along. And so it's just interesting seeing him try to reach the Jews and also reaching the Gentiles because he's educated in both of their mindset. So that's what's going on. A little background on who Paul is. His name is he used to be Saul. Saul, uh, Saul's name uh, before, back when it was Saul means destroyer. And now his name is Paul. Paul means little one and little one, like Paul refers to himself as a master builder. So I think it's interesting to, to compare and contrast how he was a destroyer. And then he refers to himself as the master builder. So he's a, goes from destroyer to the master builder. And that is just, you know, very, that's evidence on what Jesus Christ can do in your life because he had that encounter on his way to Damascus in the book of Acts. And from that moment on, he went from going this way to going that way. And it was just because of what happened on the road to Damascus. And, you know, that is, uh, that's a good study. Uh, but that is, it is very cool. Um, to 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 put all of these pieces together. So we're going to dive into the book of Romans and we're going to do a little bit of a recap. And I want you to know that um, there, this book has 16 chapters in it. And there you can break these chapters up in certain ways. Um, and chapters one through eight are going to be talking about faith for the most part. But chap we co um, we covered. <laughs> um, should Ryan do a Q and A? Uh, oh gosh. Um, Oh, man. Um, so <laughs> so chapters one through eight are going to be talking about faith for the most part. But we 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 uh, last time we went live, it was chapters one through two. And that focuses on sin. So the focus is going to be on sin from chapters one through three. So we're going to cover chapter three tonight, and that's going to be talking about sin. The reason that this is important is because you need to understand what the problem is before you get to the remedy. You can't be given like you need to understand why Jesus had to do everything he did. And that is what Romans chapter one, two and three are all going to be covering, because that's going to be wrapping our minds around sin itself. And so that is uh, that's a good thing to note. So you need to understand the problem in order to understand and fully appreciate the remedy, which is going to be Jesus Christ, as you are. I'm sure hopefully you are well aware of. Um, but then you get the. Uh, Romans 9, 10, and 11. Hey, the Jews are going to be focusing on Israel. It's going to be focusing on Israel past, present, and future in Romans 9, 10, and 11. And we'll get there. But then uh, Romans 12 through 16 is going to be focusing more on practical portions, and we'll cover that um, whenever, whenever we arrive. But the main, um, what we talked about this before, Habakkuk 2, 4. It says that the just shall live by faith. And so this is why um, this is one of the reasons why I was thinking about like what next what book should we cover next? I was thinking Galatians just because that would kind of finish the trilogy. And what do I mean by trilogy? I want you guys to understand that um, Habakkuk 2.4 is referenced by Paul in 
the book of Romans, the book of Galatians, and the book of Hebrews. Now, this is just another reason why I believe that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, because he he uses Habakkuk 2.4 in each one of his, uh, in those three epistles. And what is Habakkuk 2.4? It says that the just shall live by faith. Now, last time we went live, we talked about how Martin Luther um, was basically the one who started the Reformation because from there was like a thousand years that is referred to as the Dark Ages. Why was it called the Dark Ages? It was called the Dark Ages because that was the time period where the gospel, the scriptures were not fully accessible by the common folk. Like you and I would not be able to go get our hands on a Bible or hands on anything like that to do our own research. And so that was a very dark period. However, as per usual, his light is going to shine through and break forth. And now we have it all over the all over the world. And so now those dark ages no longer are in existence to our world in, uh, in 2024 for the most part. And so it's very cool to see that kind of thing. But when you understand what was going on back during those times, the, the church had such a stranglehold on the people. And so they were misguiding the people on a massive level. And they were telling them all that they needed to do a whole bunch of Hail Marys and give money to the church. And you need, you need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do, to do this to get saved. And so Martin Luther was having a mental breakdown, essentially, because he was always going into the church and uh, uh, he was he was asking for the priest to forgive his sins and all this. And the priest was like, how about you come back when you actually do something that's worthy of repenting for? Because he was so he was in there so often because he was so worried about his soul. He's like, I'm trying to do good and be perfect. And he's like, I can't do it. And that's why I'm in here all the time. And so that's what's interesting, because after you learn that. That um, everything that Martin Luther went through, we we talked about it uh, more in depth last time. But Martin Luther, he was told this verse, Habakkuk 2, 4, that the just shall live by faith. And so all of a sudden he was he understood that everything he was taught throughout his entire life now completely changes because of that one verse, Habakkuk 2, 4. And so he's like, wait a second, this is by faith. It's not by works. And so that is why Habakkuk 2, 4 is such a cornerstone in a sense in the book of Romans, the book of Galatians, and the book of Hebrews. And so if you pay attention to those verses that are being brought up time and time again, it's good to know the backstory on how people actually thought back in the, you know, back in the day, like, uh, you know, back in 500 AD or uh, to, for a thousand years there during those dark ages. And it also will bring a different appreciation into your world right now, because right now I have this Bible just chilling with me right here. And we're, I just picked it up. That's something that they couldn't do back then. And so that the option that you and I have to be able to dive into, thanks for giving, I appreciate that. The, the option that we have to dive into this book right now and flip our own pages and study and come to our own conclusion and do our own research and unpack. We have to dive into this book right now and flip our own pages and study and come to our own conclusion and do our own research and unpack. Chapter one is going, or we, we talked about chapter one last time. Chapter one uh, 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 basically focuses on the pagan man. It talks about the pagan man. Then chapter two talks about the moral man. And tonight we're going to get into chapter three and it's going to be talking a l primarily about the religious man. So that is going to be focusing, that's going to be the focus point. That's like the theme in a sense, because remember I told you that chapters one through three are going to be, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's basically focusing on sin. But in chapter one is talking about the pagan man referring to sin. Chapter two is talking about the moral man talking about sin. And uh, chapter three is talking about the religious man, but also talking about sin. And so um, chapter one is very interesting because um, it, Paul refers to himself as a bond servant. Now, we uh, we talked about the difference between bond servants um, because people in the TikTok world, they see one person make a comment about slavery or about servants and they're like, oh, God's terrible. And I'm like, you guys, it's just so interesting. Um, but the bond servant was a was a was a voluntary action by somebody who wanted to maintain their position with the family that they were in back in that day. So if I owed you a debt and I didn't have any money, I could give you seven years of my life to work off the debt. But then at the end of the seven years, I could say, you know what, I want to stay with you and your family because of how well you're treating me. I am making myself into a bond servant, which was a voluntary action. They would pierce the ear of somebody and that servant.
servant would wear that earring with pride and it would just be a, a representation to the family that you belong to in a sense. And so Paul is re referring to himself here as a bondservant of Jesus Christ, which means Paul is voluntarily um, becoming that servant uh, um, to Jesus Christ. And so that's pretty neat. But Romans chapter one is a uh, it's a really, really in-depth touchy kind of chapter because it's going to, it ruffles probably a lot of people's feathers. Um, but it's, it's, it's just an interesting thing when you start diving into it and you start to see how Paul, where Paul's heart is. And um, keep in mind that he went, um, now this is a letter, this is an epistle to the Romans, which means he was not currently there when he wrote this. He writes a letter from Corinth and he sends it to the Romans. But I want you to understand that there's no specific church that this was written to. This was written to, because uh, if you read in Romans chapter 1, um, verse 7, in Romans chapter 1, verse 7, he's addressing the letter and he's telling you who he's, he's writing it to. He says in Romans 1, verse 7, to all who are in Rome, and then he goes on to zoom in a little bit further, beloved of God, called to be saints. So he's writing this letter to the saints, beloved to the saints that are in Rome. And now if you remember, there wasn't a specific church because if you go back into the book of Acts and you 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 dive into those churches that were being born, born um, those churches were in the home. They were in the home. Those were house churches. And that's interesting because that's where the best learning kind of comes into play. If you've ever been involved in a small group of sorts, you know that if you, you feel so much more comfortable asking a question, if there's only like four or five to 10 or 15 other people to the max 10, 15 people inside the room, you feel so much more comfortable because now you get to know everybody on a very personal basis. You get to ask questions. People feel more freely asking questions and you guys get to, to, to dive in and figure things out. And so these churches, um, I thought mushroom was going to be a fun guy. Hi, Sheena. Sheena. What's up, Wendy? Hello. Um, um, so it's just interesting that he is writing a letter to the saints here in Romans one verse seven. Um, and he also goes on to, in verse eight that he thanks God for because their faith is being spoken throughout throughout the world. And I find that so fascinating. That is one of probably like the biggest understatement. Like it's it's that's such a slept on type of verse because th their faith is being spoken of throughout the whole world. We need to understand. Hi, Savannah. We need to understand who. Or how, how information spread back then. Information spread back then by word of mouth, by somebody hop, like riding a horse or a donkey or something like that to the other city, and it took forever. So their faith was being spoken of throughout the entire world, which meant that it was so real and in-your-face kind of faith that it made an impact on everybody who was coming and going through Rome. And that is so fascinating when you see that. Um but then you get to Romans 1, chapter 20, and in Romans 1, chapter 20, it says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Now, I'm just going to stop there for a second because I find this fascinating because it says his invisible attributes are clearly seen. How can something that is invisible be clearly seen? And we talked about that on all kinds of different levels, but it's just an interesting kind of statement. It's almost like a double negative of sorts, but it's interesting because when you take a telescope and you look up into the sky, you see everything like the stars, the sun, the moon, sky, all of these things just scream creation, which means there is a creator. And then when you do the inverse of that and you take a microscope and you go into the DNA and you unpack all those things and you see how everything is beautifully designed, it's un it's undeniable. And it's just, it's, uh, it's mind blowing that there are actually atheists out there because like, that means like you can just pick up a flower and look at how it's constructed and be like, Oh wow, these things all seem to be similar and they all kind of replicate. Like it's, 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 it's a pattern. And so that's, what's interesting. Cause when you understand how Jewish mind thinks, you understand that the Jews, they look at patterns and they search for patterns because that's how they see prophecy. You and I, as Americans, we look at prophecy as, hey, I'm going to make a prediction, and then sometime in the future, there's going to be fulfillment. That's not how the Jewish people see it. The Jewish people look at patterns. They pay attention to patterns. And so it's undeniable. It's not even a thought in the Jewish mind because they acknowledge that there is a God. However, it's interesting, and it shows you what kind of world we're living in right now because there are people in the world who think there is no God, and that is 
fascinating. James 2 talks about how even the demons believe and they tremble because if the demons believe, that tells you everything that they that you need to know, which is very interesting because if you remember in the book of Acts when we went through it, there's something called uh, uh, these guys, they were called uh, the seven sons of Siva. Now, Siva was a ch uh, one of the chief priests. There was 24 chief priests. He was one of them. But the seven sons of Siva tried to cast out these demons in by they were using the name of Jesus, but they were saying the Jesus that Paul talks about, which means that they didn't know Jesus himself. And so what ends up happening is the demon responds to these guys and he's like, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know. But who are you? These demons had they, they never would have said something like, who's Jesus? I've never heard of him before. Is, what is that? Is that a mythical creature? What is that? A unicorn? What is Jesus? No, they didn't say that. They're like, oh, I know Jesus. They know who he is. They know their time is short. And this is why it's so important to dive in here and get this gospel out to other people. Um, the gospel, which can be found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. But it's interesting in Romans 1 through uh, 1 verse 20. Moving on after it says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, without excuse, man, there's going to be, you know, it's such an interesting thing. Like just thinking about natural human tendencies, um, if your boss comes in and they ask you, hey, why, why did this happen? Your natural reaction is to defend yourself and say, well, um, that the guy over there, he, he didn't turn it in on time or you, you shift the responsibility, right? Like that's exactly what happened with Adam and Eve. Like this woman you gave me and then she blamed it on the serpent and whatnot. My point is, is that we want to shift responsibility. However, here in Romans 1.20, it says that we are all out without excuse. And that is fascinating because we all have enough knowledge of God enough to condemn us. And so um, that is, uh, you know, we, we talked about that in depth and that is just a very important verse because of all the people who, um, just think that they're, that they're going to be able to reason their way out of, uh, what's when we all stand before the Lord. And that's going to be an individually individual case by case basis. It's not, you're not going to be standing there with your mom. You're not going to be standing in front of the Lord with your dad. It's just going to be you and him. And we are all going to have to give an account. And that is interesting. Now that we talked about this before, there are two different uh, thrones. There's the judgment seat of Christ. That's the one you want to stand before. And then there's the great white throne and you do not want to go to that one. That one's terrifying. Only the lost can stand before the great white throne. The judgment seat of Christ is the one that you want to stand before. That's called the Bema seat. Okay. So then we move on into Romans chapter one, uh, moving on a little bit more. It talks about how um, you get into this very controversial, uh, politically incorrect, you know, you know, like you can get I, 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 I try to tread very lightly covering this topic because it's interesting when you read Romans 1, 24 through 32, because what you see, if you choose to see it, when you unpack this type of thing, is you start to pay attention to how um, men with men and women with women and that type of lifestyle that's running rampant in our world is a judgment when you read, you read that, that that is a judgment. God gave them up. He gave them up. He says that uh, in, in verse 24, and he says it in 26. God gave them up. He also said in verse 28 as well, he gave them up. He gave them up. He gave them up. He's not going to force anybody to come to him. He wants you to accept what he did for you because what God gave for you was everything. He gave his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sin. Man, can you imagine st trying to stand before the Lord and all of a sudden you recognize what just happened and everything that he did for you and you never accepted him? You don't have a leg to stand on. You don't like, I mean, many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not do all of these things in your name, like prophesy and all these things? And he will say, depart from me, cursed and everlasting fire. I never knew you. The reason is because they never fully accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior. And they were relying on certain works and things that they were doing instead of what he did. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit more in tonight. Anyways, it's important to understand that Romans 1, 24 through 32, it's a judgment. And that is fascinating when you start, when you see it, you can't unsee it. Those are judgments and that is running rampant in our world today. And it's a judgment. You know, it's interesting when you start paying attention to this stuff because 
you know, it makes you think if God does not judge America, then he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's crazy. Think about that. If God does not judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. There's ju judgments happening. It's going to happen sooner or later. Like we need to understand that this stuff is real. We are, you know, God is long suffering, but there is a limit to his long suffering. And then <laughs> once that limit is reached, look out because, you know, that is, it's, it's, it's coming. It's sometime in the future. I don't know when. However, I do believe that the rapture will occur in my lifetime. That's my, you know, per personal opinion. But, you know, I could be wrong on that. That's just how I see things because of everything going on in the world. Speaking of what's going on in the world right now, if you pay attention to what's happening over in Israel with Israel going into Gaza and whatnot, going against Hamas, um, they made a statement that they have taken out about 75 percent of uh, Hamas. And so that means there's only roughly 25 percent. I don't know how many uh, you know soldiers that means that are left or anything like that because they're operating underground and they have hundreds of miles of tunnels underneath uh, in Gaza, which is crazy. That warfare has to be the most difficult warfare that has ever been on this earth. I mean, if you think about it, like the things that Israel is trying to do while they're trying to protect the people in that area and, you know, who's good, who's bad, who can we trust, trying to figure all of those things out on the fly. It's unprecedented. Uh, that kind of um, military, um, you, you know, t trying to trying to figure out how to operate in that type of warfare. But anyways, what I want you to think about just because of the world we're living in is once they're done in Gaza, what then? Because you already had Lebanon, Hezbollah attacking them all over the place. You already have Iran getting involved. You see Turkey and Russia getting more emboldened. All of these things are happening. And so what I want you to do is I want you to look three, four months into the future from now. And what's what's happening? What's going to happen? I have no idea. It's just something interesting to roll around in your mind. But you're starting to see all the players come onto the scene, and that means big prophetic potential events happening in the very, very near future. It is not a, a tinder box. It's like a box of dynamite just waiting to be lit in, in, in a sense. Anyways, Romans chapter 2. We get from Romans chapter 1, which talks about the pagan man, and then we get to Romans chapter 2, and in Romans chapter 2, this is going to be talking about the moral man. However, sin is still the theme here. It's been about sin in Romans chapter 1, but it was talking about the pagan, the person who was completely lost. But now we're in Romans chapter 2, and in Romans chapter 2, it's talking about the guy who thinks he's doing pretty good because he's obeying some things here and there. And that guy is hard to reach. That person right there is a very, very difficult person to reach. How do you reach somebody who thinks that they're already good, that, who thinks that they're safe? We talked about this before. There's a false sense of security going on in a big, big, big way right now in America. Because if you go up to somebody and you're like, Hey, uh, what, what, uh, what, what religion are you? They would label themselves. There's a high chance. I should say there's a 50, 50 chance that they would label themselves as a Christian. But then when you dive a little deeper and you're like, okay, why are you a Christian? They won't have an answer. The majority of people, I'm not saying this is everybody. I'm just saying this in, in, in a, as a whole in America. But when you try to reach somebody who thinks they don't need uh, reaching, then that is where you get into some very difficult grounds because you need to, in order to be saved, you first need to understand that you need saving. And that is so important to understand. If you're just treading water in, in the ocean and I, and I come up on a boat and I throw you a life jacket or something and I'm like, hey, come, take the life jacket or take the life jacket. Like, let me pull you into the boat. You, you might not, you might not take it. Cause you're like, dude, I could do this all day. Are you kidding me? Like I can just put my feet down and I'll be good. And so then you refuse the life jacket and then I just go away. And next thing you know, you're like, I'm getting tired. I'm going to put my feet down. You put your feet down. Next thing you know, you're like, wait a second. There's no ground under me. Oh no. And then you're just trying to, to tread water. My point is, is that trying to reach people who don't think they need saving is a very difficult thing. And so that's what Romans two talks about. Um, Paul is talking to the Jews um, and he's, he's trying to get them to understand, um, he's painting them a picture all throughout Romans chapter one. And in Romans chapter two, he is building his case and painting a picture on how sin is running all over the place. 
and he needs to give them the bad news before he can give them the good news. Okay, so that is what is going on in Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 2 for the most part. Um, at the end of Romans chapter 2, it talks about circumcision uh, outwardly and circumcision circumcision inwardly. We're going to talk more about circumcision tonight. Um, but circumcision is something that was uh, the Jewish people needed to be, right? So if you go, if you remember when we covered the book of Acts, um, when Acts had, was it Titus? It was either Titus or Timothy. Um, uh, Paul did not circumcise Timothy. Oh, man. No, he, he, he didn't circumcise Titus, but he circumcised Timothy, I think is what it was. And the reason why he circumcised Timothy was because Timothy had roots to the Jewish um to the Jewish culture. And so in order to reach everybody, he had to circumcise Timothy. However, he didn't do it to Titus. Was it Timothy? Okay, thanks, Wendy. He didn't do it to Titus because Titus didn't have any ties to the Jewish religion. And so we're going to unpack some of this stuff tonight because that's just going to be a natural conversation just because of everything we're going to cover. Um, but um, the circumcision here, it's not about circumcision. You don't need to be circumcised in order to be a Jew, or I'm sorry, you don't need to be circumcised in order to be saved. And that's why he's talking about the circumcision of the heart. He's like, guys, we're no longer under the law. And that's what a lot of the things that he was talking about, because if you remember in Acts, when Peter had that dream where a, a blanket came down and there's a whole bunch of animals in there, God was telling Peter, he's like, go ahead and kill these animals and eat. Now that would, to the Jewish mind, that didn't make any sense because he's like, no, far be it from me, Lord. Like, I'm not going to do that. Are you crazy? Um, he didn't say that, but that's the idea that was behind it. Because in a Jewish mind, they had to live by the law. And so by Peter having that vision with all those animals coming down and God tells them to kill and eat, Peter, it was he was trying to get Peter to understand that everything changed after Jesus died on the cross. And so he's like, hey, God, he's like, hey, Peter, you are no longer under the law. He's like, come out from there. You are under grace. And so that is what he was trying to do with Peter. And so learning how to think in a Jewish mind is very, very important. Okay, so that is a recap of chapter one and two, a uh, short recap, because I know Eli doesn't like me going along on recaps, but um, hopefully that helps you guys out. Tamara, roll the dicers, run amok. Um, what's up, Tamara? How are you? Um, I'm there with a very long time friend right now. Where are you at, Sheena? Um, what's up, Respiratory? How are you? Um, okay, so that is a little itty-bitty recap. Tiny, tiny recap of Romans chapter 1 and 2. And um, you're doing good? Awesome. Good. Hi, Ryan. My favorite PK. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I am. I am a pastor's kid. Okay. Trying to lead her to Christ. Oh, very cool. You did a great job. Oh, man. Okay. Um, all right. So this is going to lead us into she thinks she doesn't need saving. Okay. Okay. I, I'm with you now. That, thank you for clearing that up. I was kind of trying to figure that out there. Um, she doesn't think she needs saving. Man, that is so sad. Um, what's up, DJ Nick? How are you? Good to see you, man. DJ Nick in the house? Tamara, it is said. Uh, um, a short recap. Bananas. Well, I mean, it was only chapters one and two. Um, you know, they'll get longer as we go, I'm sure, because there's going to be a lot more to what's up, Jocelyn. I just saw your post about Elon Musk. Yikes. He's a mess. Um, yeah, that post about that was just to get people to start thinking about how what was written 2000 years ago um, is now all of a sudden a possibility. Whereas back then when, when they wrote it, it was not a possibility. So that's really I'm trying to do um, is get people to think and be like, wait a second. They, they're telling us that we're not going to be able to buy or sell during the tribulation unless you have the mark of the beast. Well, how could they ever do that? So I'm just trying to get people to think critically. Um, that's the only reason I really brought that up was just because now, you know, now you can start to see how this is a very, very real possibility. Um, uh, what did he say about Musk? No, I just, uh, I just put a screenshot up on my TikTok. It just showed that there was an implant that was made um, first successful implant in the human brain. So the uh, Neuralink is 
now being introduced into human people and your state guys. I'm sure you guys have seen it too, because it's been just plastered all over TikTok. Have you guys seen the Apple vision pros or whatever they're called, where people are walking around with like snowboarding goggles on just walking around, like just doing iron man stuff. Um, it's crazy. Uh, this, this technology that we're getting is unbelievable. It is, it is advancing so quickly. Um, and I, I think it, obviously technology plays a big part into the prophetic, uh, you know, timeline into what we're, we're going to be diving into. So, you know, you could talk on that for days, but it's just interesting. The technology that you and I have, uh, access to, right? Like if I can go and purchase that thing for like $3,500 or however much they cost. And I got like 50 screens in my little vision right here. That's amazing. You can just do all kinds of stuff, learn things on the go, do whatever you want. Nobody knows what you're looking at right here. Very, very dangerous. Yes. Um, no kidding. I don't think much is human. Apple vision is creepy to me. Ready player one. Yeah, no kidding. That's, that's, that's true. Uh, and it's funny cause they're telling you what they're doing and they're gonna, they're, they always, they always seem to tell you if you pay attention to it. Okay. So, uh, um, we can go ahead and dive into Romans chapter three. And this is, uh, this is a really good, a really, really good book, a uh, really good chapter. So, um, Romans chapter three, if you guys just by way of bringing this to mind is this is going to be covering the religious man. So remember I told you before, Romans chapter three talks about, or I'm sorry, Romans one, two, and three talk about, it's talking about sin. In Romans one, it was talking, directing it towards the pagan man. In Romans two, it's talking, it's directing it towards the moral, the, the person like who's a good person. And then in Romans chapter three, um, it's going to be talking about directing it towards the religious person in a sense. And the religious person that Paul is choosing to put on display here is the Jew. And so keep that in mind. Um, so if you if you remember in Romans chapter two, verse 27, we can pick up in Romans chapter two, verse 27, just to get you to remember. I'm sorry. Romans chapter two, verse 17. Let's read Romans chapter two, verse 17 In Romans two, verse 17. It says, indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law and are confident that you that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? Okay, so I'm just going to stop there because we don't need to read the rest of it, but the whole point of me bringing that up to your mind is to get you to see that he is talking to religious people, okay? So you see that he's talking to Jews who are teaching other Jews, and he's calling them out. So he's calling these religious people out. So that's going to be what the, that's going to be the focus point here. So moving to Romans chapter three, verse one, um, in Romans chapter three, verse one, it says, what advantage then has the Jew or what is the profit of circumcision? Now, we understand just because of Romans two, verse 27 through 29, we understand in other places um, that circumcision is not enough. We know that that goes without saying circumcision is not enough. But you need to remember who. Paul is talking to here. He is still trying to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he's talking to people and he's trying to bring them along and meet them where they're at. And he's trying to tell them that um, their, their problem here is they're wondering what advantage is the Jew? Because if you remember, um, we'll go there later tonight, but in the book of Acts, um, I want to say like Acts 17, it talks about how people were struggling with the, uh, the Gentiles getting the Holy Spirit because they were like, wait a second, the Gentiles are now receiving the Holy Spirit. And that made the Jewish people worry because they were wondering, wait a second, if the Gentiles can get the Holy Spirit and we get the Holy Spirit, then are we no longer needed as a Jewish people? And so uh, we'll talk a lot about that more later on. But um, circumcision is not enough. So the question here in Romans 3 verse 1 is what advantage then has the Jew or what is the profit of circumcision? 
And so he goes on to say in verse two, he says, much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. The oracles of God, that's a very interesting uh, term here, but the, the oracles of God, what this word means, this, this means, this phrase, oracles of God, it means the words or utterances of God. They were given the Mosaic law, okay? But there's more to it than that. There's more to just um, them getting the Mosaic law. The Jews were not the only were not only the custodians of the scripture or the text, but they also were the recipients of the promises within those texts. And so it's important to understand that. And so the question on the table is, what advantage does a Jewish person have? And Paul tells them much in every way. And he tries to get them to see that they were the ones who were chosen to um, by God. And they were the custodians of the text. They were the ones who were in charge, right? They were the ones in charge of the text and in uh, relaying that information. And it's interesting when you start diving into what the Jewish people, the, like the scribes, what they would do um, back when they were writing the and making copies of all of these manuscripts, the things that they would do to make sure that the text maintain, maintained its, uh, its, uh, um, like when they were copying it from one to another, to another, to another, the lengths that they went to, to make sure that that, uh, uh, object, uh, 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 objective was achie achieved is absolutely phenomenal. They would, they would also like whenever they wrote the word Yahweh or Jehovah, they would break their quill, you know, like how they would write back on the scrolls back then. They would break their quill and they would go and they would take a bath at a complete reverence for that name of God. That's how serious they took it. And so it's very interesting to see how they used to one time, once upon a time used to think. And now we don't. Now you compare how what they used to do back in the day and you look at the speech in our world today, just on the average American. You just look at how people talk nowadays and it's embarrassing. You can't even, you, you almost get embarrassed for them when you start hearing how people think and how they talk. And you're like, wait a second, how have we fallen so far? And it's heartbreaking. Anyways, that's how much they revered the word of God back when they were uh, writing these down. And it's, it's good to know that kind of stuff because those people understood and we have, uh, for some, in a, in a lot of ways, we have lost our way here in America. But Romans chapter 1, um, it's talking about how in Romans 1, pagans are con condemned before God. Romans chapter 2 are talking about how moral men are condemned before God. And Romans 3 are talking about the religious people, the Jews, are going to be condemned before God too. Um, so it's these oracles, how Paul is bringing to mind, he is trying to tell them that these oracles of God are the words or utterances of God. And uh, it encapsulates all those things that we talked about. So then we get to Romans 3, verse 3, and it says, For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? So he's asking this question if some people don't believe. And it's important to, you know, like I, I, I kind of zoom in on the, the phrase faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God in verse 3. Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without, a, without effect? Which basically they're asking if some people don't believe, is that going to change what God is going to do? No, God is going to be fine one way or the other. It doesn't matter. But I love the phrase faithfulness of God. If you guys were here for our study of the book of Revelation, you probably remember that my favorite name of God or my favorite title is faithful and true. That's my, that's just my personal favorite. I don't know what your guys' is, what your favorite title of God is. You know, I would love to hear it if you guys wanted to tell me, but um, my favorite title of Jesus is faithful and true. And that is so cool. I just love it because, because he's faithful. I'm not, he is true and I am not. He is faithful and true. And here it's bringing up the whole phrase faithfulness of God. So he's basically saying, will their unbelief, the unbelievers, will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? And then he answers it right away in verse four, just in case you couldn't pick up on the sarcasm that he was bringing up. He says, certainly not. Indeed, let God be true. 
but every man a liar, as it is written, that you, you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. So we trust in God's faithfulness here, not Israel's unfaithfulness. We're not trusting in other people's faithfulness, like unfaithfulness. We're trusting in God's faithfulness. And so he's saying, if you don't believe God, you make him a liar. If you don't believe God, you make him a liar. One way or the other. Here, let's go to First John real quick. First John, First John, uh, chapter five. First John, chapter five. And in First John, chapter five, verse ten. In First John five ten, it says, "He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself." He who does not believe God has made him, God, a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. So the concept of uh, unbelief, the concept of unbelief or disobedience and calling God a liar are all equivalent. And that's fascinating. Unbelief is not accepting his word. And so when you don't believe God's word, you're in effect calling him a liar. Whether you mean it to be that way or not, that is exactly what you are doing. And it's an interesting thing because there's some people out there and you know, it's just an interesting conversation to have and something to kind of roll around in your own mind. But like when, I don't know if you guys have ever asked somebody, Hey, do you believe the Bible? Have you ever asked somebody that question and they say, uh, yeah, for the most part, or they say, yeah, I think most of it's real, but I don't think all of it is right. It's just an interesting thing because you and I have the Bible, you know, it's 66 books penned by 40 different authors. Many of them didn't know each other. And you have a conglomeration of all kinds of different people who are writing these books. You have kings, you have fishermen, you have, you know, random farmers, you have all kinds of like prophets and priests and stuff writing these books. And it's not just like the top dogs in the area. You have people who are at the, you know, at the bottom of the food chain who are writing some of these books. And it's just fascinating that God chose these people to do these, to write these things down. And we understand that all of these words are God breathed. And so it's just fascinating thinking about how, if you do not um, if you don't believe these things, if you don't believe what God had done, has done for you, then in effect, you are making him a liar. And that is terrifying. That is something that we need to be so, uh, so aware of. Um, but okay, moving, going back to Romans chapter three In Romans chapter three, verse four, he does a quote. He says the quote in verse four, it says, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. This is, um, he is quoting uh, uh, Psalm 51. Go to Psalm 51 real fast. Um, Psalm 51. Psalm chapter 51. Uh, Psalm 51 verse 4. And in Psalm 51, this is a really good chapter. If you guys wanted to read this, I'm not going to read the whole thing. But this chapter is basically David, and he is he's 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 pouring his heart out to God because he's acknowledging who he is and who God is. So he's comparing himself, a sinner, to God Almighty. But in Psalm 51, verse 4, it says, Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Right? Okay, so now keep that in mind because that is what that's the end game there. Now let's go read Psalm 51, verse 1. We're going to read Psalm 51, verse 1, 2, and 3 now. So in Psalm 51, verse 1, it says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. So what I want you guys to pay attention to here in Psalm 51, I want you to note that it starts off in verse 1. It says, have mercy upon me. Now, this is David. We're going to talk about him later on when we get to chapter 4. But King David is 
or was the best king of Israel. He was the best king of Israel. He was the second king. King Saul was the first king. This is the first king that this is this is who should have been king the first time. But he was the second king. But he was the best king. OK, so that guy, that king, king of, the, you know, king of the world, essentially, he's talking to God Almighty. And he says in verse one, have mercy upon me. So that's what he says. Then in verse at the end of verse one, he says, blot out my transgressions. So he he sees that he's a sinner. Right. But then he says to wash me in verse two. And then at the end of verse two, it says and cleanse me from my sin. So you're starting to see this pattern here. And then it's always it's so important to understand what's going on here in verse three. Pay attention to verse three, because in, in Psalm 51, verse three, he goes on to say this. For I acknowledge my transgressions. And that's interesting, right? Because in this is like such a, an important aspect. There are people who say, I say a, a sinner's prayer and or I did the whole magical words thing. And now I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, right? Now it's going to be a case by case basis and God knows their hearts. And so that's not for you and I to make that determination on whether somebody is not a, or is saved or not, because that's, you know, that's, that's between them and the Lord. Now we can make our own assumptions and we can look at their fruit and we can have conversations about those types of people. But what's important to understand is what David is saying in Psalm 51, verse three. He says, I acknowledge my transgressions. Acknowledgement is so important. You need to acknowledge it. You need to shine a light on it and be like, look, I am not good and you are all that is good. And so what's interesting is that he doesn't only acknowledge his transgressions. He says in verse four that he's like, I, it says in uh, Psalm 51 verse four, it says against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Pay attention to that word evil. So he acknowledges his transgressions. And it's not just like all the ones that you and I know about, like how, you know, he sent Uriah into battle so that he would get killed so that he could take uh, Bathsheba as his wife and then commit adultery. So he committed murder and adultery. But this also encapsulates all of the other sin that he has ever done. And he, he refers to it as this evil. Now, that's something that you that might seem like a, bit, a, a, a rather drastic type of word, right? Because it says evil. Like, it, and I always bring up this analogy or this example. If you were to go to work and steal a pen, from work, you were just to take a pen and you were take it, take it home with you. You would probably think, or you would never call that evil. That's not something that's not your vocabulary. That's not something you and I would do. We would not look at that and be like, oh, that's evil. Right? No. But in God's eyes, he sees sin and everything that is not good is evil. And it's just interesting how David is shining a light on it. And he is acknowledging his offense towards the Lord. And so that is that is important. That is a necessity in order to have a repentant heart. You need to acknowledge your offense. And that's what, so going back to Romans, Romans, um, so Paul brings this into play. He quotes Psalm 54, I'm sorry, he quotes Psalm 51, and he, he lets us see that David was repenting. He was acknowledging his offense, and he was saying that everything he did was evil, and he sinned against God. So moving on, in Romans chapter 3, verse 5, it says this, But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? How will God judge the world? Verse 7, it says, For if the truth of God has increased through my lie, to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And then it goes on to verse 8 and it says, Why not say, let us do evil that good may come, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say their condemnation is just. Okay, so verse 8, a question that is basically being posed here is um, what... Or, or, or what he's essentially saying is he's so keep in mind that he is building up to salvation is by grace. It's by grace, not by works. And so since it's by grace and not by works, that means that salvation cannot be lost by works. So he's building this case. He's building this case. I'm going to say it again. 
He's bringing, you need to keep it, keep in mind that he is building up his argument. He's showing everybody that, you know, it's all about sin from chapters one through three. It's just a different uh, person that he's focusing on here. And here he's bringing up the, the religious person, but he's trying to get them to see that it's salvation is by grace. It's not by works. And then by a natural byproduct, by logically thinking, that means since it's not by works that you can't lose your salvation because of your works. And that's an important thing. It's not on you to maintain your salvation. It is on God to maintain your salvation because that's what he's the good shepherd. That's, you know, John chapter 10. But a question that, th thank you, uh, Bridget, I appreciate that. But a question that comes to mind is, what keeps us from sinning? Once you become a Christian, what keeps you from sinning? And this is an interesting thought to really ponder. What, like, first off, we're never, we're, we, we mess up all the time, right? But why do we stop? What is going on? Why are we chasing uh, the, the per why, are, why are we pursuing a more holy lifestyle? Why are we doing that? That's the question that's kind of being uh, 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 given here. And it's an interesting thing. So what, what keeps us from sinning? And it should be a grateful heart um, for Jesus after you learn what you've been saved from. And so that's an interesting thing, because when you go to the book of James, we'll go to the book of James later tonight. But we, we, we already covered the book of James, and it's, it's a great book. But when you understand that the guy who wrote the book of James was Jesus's half-brother, and then you understand it, or when you learn that James, who is Jesus's half brother, once upon a time did not believe that he was the Messiah. And then all of a sudden he changed his mind on who Jesus was because of all the things that he saw. And then he gave his life to Jesus. You understand James's heart. You got, you get to see that he was like, wait a second. And like, you know, that's why a lot of people talk about how you need to have works in order to, you know, justify, you know, like all of this conversation, we'll talk about it later. But when you get to get into the mind of James and you learn that James wanted to demonstrate his, his appreciation for everything that Jesus did for him, because James understood what he was just saved from. And so that's what we should be doing. That's what that's what should be driving us to keep us from sinning is that we want to demonstrate our um, appreciation for everything that he did for us. And by a natural byproduct of that, when we demonstrate that, those are the fruit. That's the fruit that happens from that. Those are the good works that come after that. We are not justified by works. We are justified by through faith. Uh, by grace through faith. And so that is what's important because in Matthew, if you guys wanted to go there, I think it's Matthew 5, um, Matthew 5, uh, Sermon of the Mount, uh, Matthew 5, tw uh, 20, no, Matthew 5, 16. In Matthew 5, 16, it makes so much more sense. I quote this all the time, but it's in Matthew 5, 16. It says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. This is so important to understand. You're not doing the good works to maintain your salvation. You're not doing your good works to get or to obtain salvation. You are doing your good works once you become a Christian so that everybody in your world can see your good works. And then that way they see the power behind you, which is Jesus Christ. That's the whole point of it all. It is not by works it is by through by grace through faith and that is important to understand okay so going back to romans 3 verse 9 it says what then are we better than they okay so in romans 3 9 thanks bridget it says in romans 3 9 it says what then are we better than they so the we that he's talking about here he's talking about the jews so it says are the jews better than they or the gentiles they are so the question is are the Jews better than the Gentiles? What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previous, previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. They are all under sin. And hold on. I want to see something real fast. See if... Um, okay. So we are all under sin. So Paul is shining a light and he's shining a light how it's not just the Jews in one category, the Greeks or the Gentiles in another, but he's he's lumping them all. He's saying that we are all under sin. So go to Matthew 5, verse 20. So in Matthew 5, verse 20, 
it says this, Matthew 5, 20, it says, For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is Jesus talking here in uh, Matthew chapter 5. But it's very interesting when you pay attention to this because Jesus is saying, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, this had to have been a massive blow to the Jewish mind. Right. The reason why this had to have been a massive blow to the Jewish mind, because this because because of how the the regular Joe Blow, the regular, you know, you know, guy, the regular Jew, when they thought of the scribes and Pharisees, those guys were like experts. They were the professional people. They were the ones who should have were like the most holy in the in their mind. Right. And so Jesus comes up and he's like, unless you your righteousness exceeds the experts, then you're not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. And so that must have just like been a, like a, a dart through the chest there because like, they're like, well, wait a second. I can't be more righteous than the Pharisees and the scribes. So how is this going to happen? The whole point was to lead them into understanding that everything was about to change. So Jesus shows up, they were under the law from basically from Genesis 12, all the way to Acts chapter two. They were under the law from that entire period. Everything changed, though, after Jesus died. After Jesus died and rose again, now they're on, Now we are under grace, and that is an amazing gift. We are here at an amazing time in our world right now, and we need to understand that. Can you imagine having to go, like, being alive during that time that they were alive and putting yourself in their shoes and thinking how they were, th like, a Jewish mind was thinking? And you're like, wait a second, I got to do this. I got to do this. There's so many ordinances I got to follow. I got to keep up with the law. I don't even know the law. I got to make sure I don't do this on this day or do this on this day so that I might offend this person. Can you imagine the stress, the the weight, the burden? And, like, that is what, you know, we talked a lot about that in the book of Acts. But you and I are under grace. Okay, uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Um, we are going to be reading uh, these next couple of verses, and I want you to know, just so you can be mentally prepared, uh, the majority of these verses that we're going to look up are going to be in the book of Psalms, okay? So this is uh, the majority of the, these are quoted in the book of Psalms. So in Romans 3, verse 10, it says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Okay, so... This first one, let's go to Psalm 14. And if you just want to hold your place in the book of Psalms, so that way you don't have to keep trying to find the book, because um, we're going to be flipping through here. So I just want to show you where these are being quoted from. But in Psalm uh, 14, uh, verse 1 through 3, it says this. Psalm 14, verse 1 through 3. Psalm 14, verse 1, it says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from the heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. So, okay, so that is where that is de derived from. So he's quoting there. And now we go back to Romans 3, verse 11. Romans 3, verse 11, it says, There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. Okay, so now let's go to Psalm 53. Psalm 53. And in Psalm 53, verse 1 through 3, this is where those verses are taken from. Psalm 53, verse 1 through 3, it says this, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and have done abominable iniquity. There is none who does good. God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who seek or any who understand who seek God. Every one of them has turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. No, not one. Okay, so going back to Romans 3, 12. It's interesting because they use the word profitable there. It says in Romans 3, verse 12, it says, They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. The word unprofitable there 
in Romans 3.12 has the idea of like spoiled, uh, spoiled fruit, which basically is saying that it's basically good for nothing is the idea that's behind it. Okay, so let's move to Romans 3.13. In Romans 3 verse 13, it says, Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Now, the poison of asps, asp, uh, the word asps there, that's like the, the Egyptian snake the back. Uh, that's what he's referring to. Is an, it's an Egyptian snake. Um, but what he is quoting here is Psalm 5. Go to Psalm chapter 5. Psalm chapter 5, verse uh, 9. Psalm chapter 5, verse 9. This is the first part of what we just read. Psalm chapter 5, verse 9. It says, For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongue. Okay, so that is where we covered most of that. But now let's go to Psalm 140. Psalm 140. What's up, Mateo? How are you, man? Psalm 140, verse 3. In Psalm 140, verse 3. I know we're, we're flipping all over the place. Psalm 140, verse 3, it says, They sharpen their tongues like a serpent. The poison of asps is under their lips. Selah. Now, if you guys remember the word Selah there, it means to stop and think and dwell on what you just read. So if you go back and read Psalm 140, uh, verse 1, 2, and 3, then you're supposed to stop whenever you see Selah and think about what you just read and kind of meditate on that. Okay, so let's go back to Romans. Um, Romans 3, verse 14. In Romans 3, verse 14, it says, Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. This is also in the psalm. Go to Psalm 10. Psalm 10. And in Psalm 10, um, verse... Uh, psalm 10... Um, Oh, Psalm 10, verse 6, it says, He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. Verse 7, his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. And it goes on. But that's but that's what we were kind of talking about before, about how our world is today. It's like it's almost embarrassing when you pay attention to just the normal way people are thinking today. And there's, it's also very interesting because there are Christian people who swear openly and they just say it and they don't even care. Now I'm not here to make a big, you know, like a big statement on, you know, like, Hey, is this a bad word? Or am I sinning when I say this or this or this or this? The only thing I want people to think about is to number one, are you, who are you more identifying with? If this is something that you guys struggle with, if you guys are struggling with swearing or if you try, like, you're like, oh, I think I should clean up my, my mouth or whatever, or my act. My, my question is, because there's people who are like, oh, it's not a bad word. And they make that statement. And these are Christian people, mind you. What I would encourage you or challenge you to think about is who are you more identifying with when you use certain words? That's it. That, that boil it down to Barney style here. Like it's not it, like, this is not rocket science, right? Like we need to understand, are you more like the world when you do something or are you more like God when you do something? Now, if I start saying mother, you know, MF, you know, all these words and I like justify why I'm okay to say it because you know, Oh, it stands for this. It's not even a bad word or whatever. No, you need to check yourself and you need to be like, well, wait a second. Would I be doing these words if I was physically walking, you know, with Jesus would, or could I see Jesus saying these things? Because like he would, I could see Jesus justifying and saying all these bad words that we label as cuss words or whatever. My point is, is you need to understand who you are as a Christian. You need to remember that you are an ambassador 
ambassador of Christ, you are not an ambassador ambassador of you. You are an ambassador of Christ. You are representing Jesus. And if you are representing Jesus, then you need to start acting like it. And so that's a difficult thing because if I got to start acting like Jesus, then that means I got to start giving up this sin over here and this sin over here. And then you were like, all of a sudden we're convicted because we're like, well, wait a second. I don't want to give up those sins because I'm cool or it's funny when I use those words or it's cool if I do this and people laugh or everybody else is doing it or whatever reason that we want to bring in all, all the justifications that we're doing for ourselves, we need to remember we are not here for us. We are, have never been here for us. The whole purpose of you being here right now after you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior is to glorify God, and that is it. That is it. That's what 1 Corinthians um, uh, 3 talks about because it talks about how d- during that day, all of your everything's going to be tried by fire. Your your gold, your silver, your precious stones are all going to be tried by fire. And then all of the other things that are also going to be tried by fire, which are the wood, hay, and stubble. And the things that remain, those are the things you will get a reward. So what you need to understand, you got to, well, we just need to wrap our minds around what we're, we're dealing with, I guess, is what I'm getting at here. Okay. I don't mean to be waxing very long there. Let's go back to Romans. Um, Romans chapter three, verse, uh, 15, Romans chapter three, verse 15 In Romans three, 15, it says their feet are swift to shed blood. Their feet are sh- swift to shed blood. Let's go to Isaiah, Isaiah 59, Isaiah 59, uh, verse seven. Isaiah 59, verse seven. In Isaiah 59, verse 7, it says, Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their path. The way of peace they have not known, and there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever take that way shall not know peace. Woo! Okay, so that is what he is quoting there. Um, and then we get to verse, um, 16, which is, uh, which is brought into what we just read in, in Romans chapter three, verse 16, it says destruction and misery are in their ways. Now that's brought into the passage that we just read in Isaiah and also verse 17, Romans three seventeen, it says in the way of peace, they have not known. So all of that is encapsulated there in Isaiah 59 verse seven and eight. But then we get to Romans 3, verse 18, and it says, There is no fear of God before their eyes. And so this is the last one that we're going to look up here in Psalms. So go to Psalm 36. Psalm chapter 36. Psalm chapter 36. In Psalm chapter 36, verse 1, it says, Psalm 36, verse 1, it says, An oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked. There is no fear of God before his eyes. So he's quoting everything that's going on here. Um, He's quoting everything that most of those things that he just quoted were from David, from uh, the book of Psalms. Um, And he also quoted Isaiah in there as well. So now we move to verse 19. And in verse 19, he continues on and he's, 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 uh, he's, he's built, keep in mind, He's been he's been working his case. He's building his case, building his case, building his case. And so in verse 19, it says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Why was the law given given to us? So that we can know what sin is. He gave it to us. Now, this is interesting because we talked about this before, but when you compare the law and you go to the exact opposite of the law, what is, what is the opposite of having the law? It would be not having the law, right? So on one hand, you have the law. On the other hand, there is no law. So that's why, like, if you if you look at that and you look at one of the titles of Satan or Lucifer, you understand that he's referred to as the lawless one, which means there is no law in his mind. And so 
that's uh that's that's not what we want but since we do have the law since we were given the law now we know what sin is and so now there's a light being shine shown around and now we know that we are all sinners and so it's interesting because in verse romans 3 verse 20 it says therefore by the deeds of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin by the deeds of of the law. That's interesting. Keep that in mind. Let's go to Galatians 3. Hello, Cherokee. Uh, Galatians 3.20. Um, in Galatians 3.20, it says, uh, it's in Galatians 3.20, I think. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Galatians 3.24. Galatians 3.24, it says this, therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. I'm just going to read that again. Galatians 3.24, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. By faith. Not by works, not by following the law, but by faith. That is massive. It is so important to understand that. There are people, now we're going to get to this later on too, but you need to understand that there are people who are doing the law and then adding it to Jesus and what he did. So they're doing it, putting faith, their faith in their works as if it's something that they could earn, but then they're also lumping Jesus in there. So they're putting their faith in their works and in Jesus. And you need to understand that that's a dangerous place to be because you need to put your faith in Christ and Christ alone. Then the works happen after that, but they're not what save you. That's why I use the baseball analogy. First base, Christ and Christ alone. That's it. Putting your faith in him. That's it. Second base would be baptism if you want to go on, but you know, baptism doesn't save you. Water baptism doesn't save you. You're just following Christ in his footsteps. Third base would be good works. Good works don't save you. That's only first base. That's Christ and Christ alone. That's what I need you to understand. There's people who are dancing on a very fine line and being, you know, you know, it's between them and the Lord. But where are you at? Ask yourself, are you like hoping that your works are going to maintain your salvation? There are people who believe you can lose your salvation. I'm not one of those people. Because if you can earn your salvation, then that means that Jesus, what he did wasn't enough, right? Like you need to come, can keep working to earn it and to, to deserve it almost. Well, we cannot deserve it. We don't deserve it. And that's an important thing to understand. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. And mercy is not getting what you do deserve. And that's crazy because we have like, thank God for his grace. It's just an interesting thing. Like we need to understand that it is through faith and faith alone. And that is so cool. Like it's, it's almost, it, it's almost goes against what we naturally want to think. It, it goes against like, it, it, like, human nature because you and I as humans need to feel like we earned something. That's how we are born and re uh, b raised to feel like if I just walked up to you and I handed you a trophy, you would be like, I'm not taking that. I didn't earn it. Right. Like you just wouldn't take it. You'd be like, no, no, no. I need to win. I need to beat everybody else in order to get that trophy. Like that's how we need to feel because we're competitive. Like I got to be the best basketball player, hockey player, golfer, volleyball player, whatever. That's how we are trained, right? That's how our mind is thinking right now. And so when God shows up and he's like, you just need to believe. You just need to put your faith in me. When he says those things, it's going against what we've been doing our entire life. And so we need to remember that it is through Christ and Christ alone, not through me and me alone. It's not through what I've done. It's not through what I've done and what he's done. No, it's what he's done. And that's it. Uh, do you want to ad address Richie Rich? Um, hello, Richie Rich. Water baptism is only up, 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 up to Christ. Water baptism only a declaration to Christ. Baptism is the Holy Spirit is what matters. Yeah, um, not water baptism. Water baptism doesn't save you. Now, there's a difference between water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, for sure. When you get saved, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit. That is a one and done deal. <clears throat> okay, so. Now, let's go back to Romans chapter 3, verse 21. And in Romans chapter 3, verse 21, it starts off, Paul starts off by saying, 
but now. Okay, so where he says in verse 21, but now, this is him concluding. This is him getting to the end of his, his entire case. So again, just in case, just to help you remember, in Romans chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, the theme is about sin. Now, the topic was on a different person. On chapter 1, it was about the pagan. On chapter 2, it was about the good person, the moral guy. And chapter 3, it was talking about the religious person. So he's going to start wrapping things up here because we've just been through the gauntlet about all kinds of bad stuff, right? Bad, like it's all, oh, everything's terrible. So the good thing, good stuff is coming. But remember what I told you, in order to, you need to first understand the problem in order to appreciate the remedy. Okay, so in Romans chapter 3, verse 21, it says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Interesting, the righteousness of God apart from the law. I don't know how many times you can like say it, you, you can just, you know, you could just keep on saying this, but it's a righteousness of God outside of the law. The law, it's nothing to do with. The law is nothing. Okay. Um, verse 22, it says, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, this is a, this is a, this is a, a very interesting thing here in verse 22. First off, in Romans 3, verse 22, it says, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all. Interesting that it says to all and on all. To all and on all. Now, this, again, refutes the Calvinistic type of standpoint because Calvinists, uh, not all of them, but some of them believe that everybody is predestined and like, you know, it doesn't matter what I do. I don't, I don't need to go out there and tell people the gospel because God already predestined. If you're going to come to Christ, you're going to come to Christ. Like that's how they think. They don't like, that's not all of them, but that's how some of them think. But here it's clearly telling us that this is, this is the righteousness of God. It's through faith in Jesus Christ. And it's not just to you and I, it's not just to the people who are saved right now and to the people who are going to get saved. This is given to every single person ever, ever, ever. It, it's a free gift, not just to some people. Now, the people who do not accept it, that is their choice. Now, that's a, but it's important to understand that the choice was there for them to accept it. God just knew that they would not. And so that doesn't mean that it wasn't offered to them because it is offered to them. And so it's important to understand that. But in verse 22, it says, even the righteousness of God through faith, it doesn't say through works in Jesus Christ or through tithing or giving money or to missionaries or anything like that in Jesus Christ. It says through faith in Jesus Christ. That is so important to understand. There are people who say that you need to get water baptized out there in order to get saved. No, you don't. Because that's something that you're doing. That's something that you are physically working for, right? No, you will do those things by a natural byproduct of becoming saved. However, that is not what saves you. You are saved through faith in Jesus Christ. End of story. That is it. That is, I will die on that hill all day. But then it goes on to Romans 3.23. And it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that is the very first verse in what you and I can talk about here for a second, because this is what is referred to as the Romans road. If you guys ever want to tell somebody about Jesus Christ and get them, lead them to a place of where they can actually understand, then you need to basically walk them down what is called the Romans road. Exactly, Ryan. What's up, Richie Rich? Um, so the Romans road, what is the Romans road? It basically is a, it, it's, it's a, it's a phrase that we, that Christians have developed um, that is it's something that you can you can go up to somebody if you're witnessing to them. You can open your Bible and you can say, hey, can you read these couple verses for me? Because at the end, you'll be able to understand. And so it, it starts in Romans 3.23. And in Romans 3.23, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so the Romans road, you're starting off by saying, hey, you're a sinner and I'm a sinner. And we've all fall short of the glory of God. Sounds terrible, but let's not end there. Then you go to Romans 6.23. You take them to Romans 6.23, and I would encourage you guys to have them read it, because if they read it, then it's going to be, it's gonna they're going to think more. 
So in Romans 6, 23, it goes on to say, for the wages of sin is death. Sounds terrible because you just, you just told them in Romans 3, 23 that everybody sinned. So now I'm learning that for the wages of sin is death. But then it gets better. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then after that, you take them to Romans 10, 9. And in Romans 10, 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, if you remember our study in the book of Acts, you will note that or you will remember that Paul and Peter never miss an opportunity to bring up the resurrection because the resurrection is everything. If you remove the resurrection from the Bible and keep everything else the same, the Bible is nothing. Without the resurrection, it's nothing. The resurrection is everything. The, re re the resurrection is so, it, it's the, it's the, oh man, it's, it's what gives you and I hope because he rose from the dead, which means that you and I will raise from the dead. And that is an amazing hope. That is our hope. So you tell them that in Romans 10, 9, and then after Romans 10, 9, after they do that, you bring them to Romans 5, verse 1. Because in Romans 5, verse 1, it gives you another promise. In Romans 5, 1, it says, Therefore, having, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that is something you guys can just fall on whenever you're struggling, whenever you're like, sheesh, what's up? Whenever, um, whenever you're just like, man, <laughs> you know, you know, I, uh, I understand there's people out there who believe you can lose your salvation and that must just be absolutely heart, like, you know, like pulling your heart out of your chest half the time because you almost are walking on eggshells thinking that you're not being good enough. And that has to be like just such a difficult way to think. And like some people are like, oh, that's just like an excuse. You know, people people believe once saved, always saved. And they just do that just so they can live whatever the way that they want to. And I'm just like, I don't know who's doing that. I'm sure there are people who are doing that, but that's not what I'm doing. I understand that since I am saved, I am always saved. And I'm going to live as a uh, an example. My life is going to be a testimony for him because that's what I, I understand what I was, I've been saved from. And so that's what I am going to do. Now, the people who, you know, say, oh, I'm a Christian, like, I don't believe half of them are, have ever accepted Christ, or it was actually genuine. I don't believe they ever were. I just think that they told themselves that they were because they said some magical words and like, but God knows their heart. And so that's why it's important to, you know, use all the, the verses that we have access to, because when you understand that uh, many will say in that day, Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not done all these things? My point is, is that there's people in our world right now who said, who, who label themselves as Christians, but they never were. And that's why God says them, depart from me. I never knew you. What, what, what do you mean he never knew you? Like, no, he knows my sheep know my voice, right? So, um, uh-oh, on that hill again. <laughs> yeah. So it's just an interesting thing. So the, those, that's the Romans road that we just went through. So if you're trying to witness to somebody and you want to like kind of walk them down the quote unquote Romans road, those are the verses that you can take them to. And it starts off by getting them to acknowledge that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it ends in the best way ever. Right. And so we have peace with God. Right. After being justified freely. We need to understand that. And so that's a good tool to have or at least write down in your Bible so that you can, you know, go back to it late at a later time. OK, going back to Romans three, Romans three, verse uh, 23, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Then it goes on to verse 24. It says in Romans three, 24, it says being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. OK, so it says being justified freely. So justified. What is justified? What does it mean? Uh, justified. It means that you have been declared righteous. And this is what is so interesting, being declared righteous. And I need you guys to understand that when you guys are declared righteous or when you guys are declared justified or declared righteous, however you want to word it, it's an all at once type of thing. It is an all at once type of thing. It's not a little by little. You are declared righteous. You are covered. You guys remember in our study of Hebrews, we talked about the day of atonement. The difference from what they did back in the Old Testament was 
the difference from the Old Testament and the New Testament is the Old Testament, in a way, in a sense, is that they were they were killing animals and they were using animal blood to cover themselves with, right? Like, you know, you understand what I'm saying. They were relying on animal blood. That was a Band-Aid. That was a Band-Aid. That was a temporary solution for something that was going to happen in the future. That something that was going to happen in the future was Jesus's blood. So they were using animal blood and they were, that was what was temporarily covering them. But then when Jesus came, his blood washed everybody white as snow. So the animal blood was just a covering. Jesus's blood washes your sin completely. It's gone. It's completely, it's no longer. And so that is what is going on here in this situation. So when you have been justified, you have been declared righteous, which means his righteousness is now in you, which means when Jesus looks at you, or I'm sorry, when God looks at you, he sees his son's righteousness. He sees Jesus's righteousness. That's what he sees. It's like that whole putting on the robe when Adam and Eve sinned, God killed an animal. That's the first thing he did. He took that animal skin and he covered them. And that was a picture of what was going to happen on later on into the future because Jesus was going to be that ultimate sacrifice. That is why we no longer have sacrifices in our world right now because he paid it all. When he died on the cross, he said, it is finished to tell us die, right? It is paid in full. And that is amazing. So now we understand that there's going to be more sacrifices in the future. Hey, thank you, Apple. We know that there's going to be more sacrifices in the future because in Daniel 9, uh, verse 27, it says that the Antichrist is going to cause the sacrificing sacrifices and uh, oblations to cease. In order for there to be sacrifices, there needs to be a temple, right? There's going to be an actual physical temple. People are like, oh, how do you know that this, the temple's not like our, we are the temple. And I'm just like, are you high and drunk? Like, no, I don't say that. But it's just funny how people say that type of thing, because I'm like, you, you got to dive a little bit deeper because you understand in Revelation 11 that there's going to be two witnesses that are going to be physically in front of an actual temple. Like they're not going to be. Sta the My point is, is that there's going to be another temple. There's going to be sacrifices that are going to happen in the future. And you're seeing that stuff happening in our world right now because you have the four red heifers that are over there. And they have been, the Jewish people have been looking for these red heifers for the longest time. And now they have four of them all at once. It's just absolutely crazy. So my point is, you can't just, just spiritualize and allegorize these types of things when it's clearly not that way. The more I dive into the word of God, the more I learn, the more literal I take things. And so you have people, you have Christians who allegorize a whole bunch of stuff. And then you have other people like me over here who take it as a very literal, literal, uh, way, you know, like the millennial kingdom, the there's all millennialists that they label themselves all millennialists. And they think that it's like a, oh, it's a thousand years where God's going to reign in our hearts and they spiritualize. And I'm like, no, like this is what second Samuel chapter seven has been talking about the entire time. It's a literal 1000 year reign on the earth and it's going to happen. My point is, um, uh, Romans 3.24, where it says of being justified freely. Uh, thanks, Bridget. Being justified freely. You have been declared righteous. That is so cool. You can just melt in that verse for a long time and just be like, I'm owning this verse. This one's mine. Because it's so cool. Being justified freely. It's a free gift, something you didn't earn by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Okay, so in verse 25, you get this weird word that's called the, the word propitiation. Um, propitiation. So the idea behind the word propitiation is uh, an atoning victim, uh, which is kind of uh, weird, right? A atoning victim. So read it again. It says in verse 25, whom God set forth as an atoning victim uh, by his blood through faith, right? So he was, he, he knew what he was coming to do. Jesus knew what he was here to do. Like this, like the, no surprise. He knew, he knew what his purpose was and it's, it, it, he did it willingly. It's unbelievable. But it says, uh, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith. Again, through faith. I need you guys to understand. Um, I need you guys to understand it's through faith. Like it's, 
you need to be so careful in our world, especially in the TikTok world where people can just scroll and go to somebody else who's teaching the Bible or, you know, who's a, a, a I'm apostle Christopher and like I'm prophetess, you know, so and so and like all the, they label themselves, but they're they're talking about Bible and they're good. They're talking about good things. Right. And so people get confused. My point is you can't get confused on this. You need to know this forward and backward. And I always challenge you guys. I'm like, hey, do you know your phone number? Could you tell me your phone number right now? Do you know your address? Yeah, you know your address. Do you know your last name? Yeah, you do, because you those are important things in the world today. Do you know your social security number? You probably do. But then right when I say, hey, how do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? It's like all of a sudden people are like dancing on eggshells and they're like, oh, well, if you go over here and over here, over here. And they make it this long, extravagant thing. And I'm like, man, it's a really simple thing, but you need to know what it is more than anything else is you need to, you know, you need to understand that it's through faith. It's not by doing all this other stuff that you think that you're doing to earn your salvation. No, be very careful not to mix that up. Okay. So it says through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Woo. Forbearance. Uh, the word, another word forbearance could be just tolerance. Uh, so it, it could say, because in his tolerance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Okay. Um, it says in verse 26, it says to demonstrate at the present time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. It's interesting how everything we're talking about here kind of makes a lot more sense why people refer to this as the gospel according to Paul. That's, do you guys see a little bit now uh, why people refer to the book of Romans as the gospel according to Paul? Even though this isn't the gospel or anything like that, but you can see why people label this the gospel according to Paul. Because everything you're seeing here is everything that they preach on in the book of Acts, which is about Jesus dying, and not only dying, but rising from the dead. This is all about Jesus, and that is what Paul is just driving in there. But here... It's interesting because the in verse 26, we're talking about, um, it says that he might be just and the justifier. So the problem here, this is, this is God's problem in a sense, if you choose to look at it this way. One of God's problems is how can he maintain being just and yet justify sinful men? How can God maintain being just? How can God be just? and yet justify sinful men. How can he do that? The answer is only one way, and it's only been one way, and it's only ever going to be one way, and the answer is Jesus. Jesus is the answer. It's not anything you can do. You can't work for it. You can't earn it. My, you need to understand it is through Christ and Christ alone. Verse 27, Romans three twenty-seven. It says, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Okay, so you're, you're getting, like I told you before in verse 21 that he was going to start concluding, right? And so he is concluding. And so he even said that in verse 28, he said, therefore, we conclude. He's like, I just spent the last first chapter, the second chapter, and this chapter all on building this whole point to get you to understand the sin. I need you to understand the problem. The problem is the sin. But then he's concluding it here in verse three by saying, therefore, we conclude that a man is justifi justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law, which means you can take that law and you can just throw it over there. And then you're like justified by faith. That's what you need to understand. It, it, you are justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. That is an important thing. So um, let's go to Genesis uh, 15, 6. We're actually going to be in Genesis uh, quite a bit here um, when we get to chapter 4. Go to Genesis 15, 6. We'll touch on it real quick. Um, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, it says, uh, it says, in Genesis 15, verse 6, it says, And he, this is referring to Abraham, and he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Okay, now this verse might seem familiar to you because um, we've 
talked about it uh, in uh, the book of James. And it's mentioned a couple other places as well. But it says, and he believed in the Lord and God accounted it to him, Abraham, for righteousness. The reason why we're talking about this right now is because you need to understand uh, that that uh, Abraham believed in the Lord and God accounted it to him for righteousness. You need to understand that this was before the law. This precedes the law. The law was not in existence when Abraham was saved. You need to understand that. This is going to come into play in Romans chapter 4. But you need to understand that Abraham was counted righteous before the law. He also was accounted uh, he got accounted it to him for righteousness before circumcision. So the whole way a Jewish person thinks is number one in a Jew in a Jewish mind, you need to be circumcised. Like, oh, oh you got to be circumcised. Like, no, it's not. You don't need to be circumcised. Abraham was not circumcised, and he was saved. Abraham did not follow the law because there was no actual Mosaic law during this time, and he was still saved. So it's important. Those are important things to understand. So that goes back to Romans 3, verse 28, because it says, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. And Abraham is a prime example of that. And he's going to use that here in Romans chapter four. Let's continue. Romans chapter three, verse 29. Romans chapter three, verse 29. It says in verse 29, it says, or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. So one is circumcised by faith and the other one is circumcised through faith. You can be circumcised by faith, which is referring to the, the Jews, and then you can also be he, the, the justified, uh, the uncircumcised will be justified through faith. So that's the, the idea of what was going on in uh, Romans chapter 2. Because in Romans chapter 2, you're talk to, it talks about circumcision of the heart. And then it also talks about the uh, circumcision of the Jewish people, which is, you know, referring to the foreskin. So you have a physical circumcision and then you have the internal circumcision of the heart. And so that's what it, this is bringing that into play, because we are all going to be justified. Now, you can be a justified by the circumcision, which is referring to the Jews, but you can also be uncircumcised and justified through faith as well. So that's what that is referring to. Verse 31, it says, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Because now, if you remember where, how it says in verse 31, it says, we establish law. That should make you remember Romans 3, verse 20. So go back to Romans 3, verse 20. In Romans 3, verse 20, it says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So here he says we establish the law in verse 31 and we understand that the law is what gives us the knowledge of sin. So we understand when we do something wrong and he's reinfor reinforcing the idea that we is that we establish the law, the law. OK, so that is Romans chapter three. Um, I'm going to put you guys on pause for uh 20 seconds and then we will get into Romans chapter four. So just give me uh, give me. 25 seconds, uh, 20 seconds, and then we will get into Romans chapter four. So just give me, uh, give me 25 seconds. All right, Michelle, have a good night. Oh, thanks, Candace. I appreciate that kind of hot in these rhinos. Oh man. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Um, hopefully you can hear me. Yes. Okay. Hi, Blondie. What's up, Corin? Wendy. Candace. Hello. Neo the pug. What's up? Thank you guys for being here. Um, going through the book of Romans. Yes. Respiratory. Cool. Sheila. Hello, Sheila. Uh, Fred, what's up, man? Keith. 
Yep, all good. Arf, arf. <laughs> all right. Um, cool. Well, I appreciate you guys being here. Okay, so that is Romans chapter 3. That's a good verse or a good chapter, I should say. Um, you know, um, twa. What's up, Jules? How are you? Um, that is Romans chapter 3, and that's a good, good chapter. Man, but hopefully you guys are starting to see it a little bit. Um, Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3, the idea is on sin. And so now, if you guys remember, we talked about this. But Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3 was going to be talking on sin. And now we're diving into four, chapter 4. And this is going to be, we're going to start talking about more of salvation. Yes, it was. I came in at the end part. Cool. Um, well, we are going to continue. And if you're interested, I'm going to upload all of these on uh, YouTube. So if you're interested, the YouTube link is in my TikTok profile. If you would like to go back and rewatch all of those, um, they're up there. There is a link in the TikTok, in the Tiki Talks. So that is there if you would like to use that. However, we uh, always do recaps as well. So, you know, we might touch on some of the things that you missed uh, next time. So um, who knows? Who knows how that goes? Um, okay, Romans chapter four. Um, we can get into Romans chapter four. And this is a good chapter, too, because it gets it. it you need to understand, like it, it forces you to almost get a history lesson. Um, I'm stuck on video two with revelation. <laughs> oh man. Oh, video two. Oh, uh, what is it? Roman two. So are you in chapter three? Is that chapter three? It's probably chapter three. Um, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So you're in Philadelphia and Laodicea, maybe. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, okay. So Romans chapter four. So we can go ahead and dive into Romans chapter four. And um, some of the questions that we're going to have to talk about here in Romans chapter four, or that we are going to be confronted with are, um, we're going to be talking about Abraham. And we're going not only going to be talking about Abraham, but we are also going to be uh, talking about David. Revelation was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed Revelation too. Yeah, that was a really good one. I got pumped. I was getting pumped up about that, man. Going through that book, I was like, let's freaking go. Okay, okay. Romans 4. Um, just know, just keep in the back of your mind that we're going to be talking about Abraham. We're going to be talking about David. Okay, so those are going to be things that are going to um, come, come to mind or uh, be a part of this conversation that we're going to dive into. Um, so... Um, today, today, no, uh, uh, Mate uh Mateo, no, uh, we're going to be talking about it right now in Romans chapter four, uh, Mateo, we're going to be talking about Abraham. We're going to be talking about David as well. Let's do it again. Revelation. <laughs> um, no, not right now. I can't. Okay, fine. Let's do it. Revelation chapter one. No, I'm just messing. Um, I, yeah, <laughs> no, I want to, no, I don't. Okay. Revelation chapter, I'm sorry, <laughs> ah, Romans chapter four, here we go, in Romans chapter four, um, it says this, if you guys would stop distracting me, Revelation 119, yeah, there's the outline, that's such a good outline too, um, I, I just can't, um, where are we, my Bible is written all over, awesome, mine is too, I'm telling you what, when my eyesight starts going, I'm going to be so upset, because all my little notes all over the place. I won't be able to read them. I'm going to have to get like these giant bifocals and just like, <sighs> anyways, right all over your Bible guys. That's what I do. I mean, whenever, cause, cause it's difficult. Sometimes like you read a passage and you're like, man, I completely forget what this was all about. But if you write something on the sideline that kind of jogs your memory and you're like, Oh, this is what it's talking about. It really helps. Uh, taking your time to do the, yeah, Sheila, for sure. <sighs> repeat it, repeat it twice. Savannah's laughing at me. Utterly distracted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ralph gets it. I, I stepped on my glasses. Well, you showed them. Okay. Um, Romans chapter four. We're going to do it. Okay. In Romans chapter four. Um, hopefully you didn't break your glasses, Jules. That would be a bummer. Okay. Here we go. Romans chapter four. In Romans chapter four, verse... Yeah, utter. It says Romans chapter four, verse one... Um, 
Romans chapter four, verse one, it says, what then shall we say that Abraham, our fathers or our father has found according to the flesh? Okay. So in Romans chapter four, verse one, where it says, what then shall we say that Abraham, our father has found according to the flesh? And so talking about Abraham, let's talk about Abraham for a second. Um, Abraham, he is, he's, it says that Abraham, our father, Abraham, I utterly did. <laughs> Let's go. Um, it says in, it says in Romans where it says Abraham, our father. So it's interesting. So Paul is talking to these Jews. He's talking to the Jewish people. He's saying Abraham, our father. Now you need to understand the word father. It has the idea of first father. So it's not just father, like in a general sense, but it has the idea of the first father. And so you can almost refer to that as a founder. He is the founder. So he's the founder. He's the first Hebrew in a sense, but I'm going to, I'm going to give you something to think about here because this is very thought provoking. When you think of Abraham, you think of Abraham, you probably think you're like, okay, he's, he's the first Jew, right? He's the first Hebrew. And that's what everybody would say. But I want you to think about it in a different kind of way because you could make an argument. I'm not being super dogmatic on this. I'm just saying, I'm just bringing it because it's a thought. But you could make a, a case that he was once upon a time a Gentile. And that's interesting because the circumcision was a sign of the faith for the Jewish people, right? And so... Abraham was not always circumcised. He, he was he was an older guy when he got circumcised, and that's like when he was told to do that type of thing. And then that's you know like a sign of the Jewish people. And so that's interesting. So before he was doing that, before he was given that, like it's just like wait a second. So he was a Gentile, then he became the Jew. It's like wow, that's really interesting. But what I want you to understand here is that the Jewish people look at Abraham as almost like the role model of all role models. And, uh oh, am I glitching? Can you guys, am I? No, stop buffering. Is it better? Is it better? No. Oh, man. Oh, I was. Am I, uh, am I glitching still or is it, are you guys, okay, it's good for me. Okay, we're better. We're back. No glitching here. Okay. You're good on my end. Okay. Hey, hello, Mama Wolf. Um, okay. So um, I always like when people who never talk finally do say something like Mama Wolf, like, thanks for being here. I don't know. I think I'd have seen you before, but it, it's probably very seldom. Um, hello, sheesh. <laughs> Fred. All right. No glitching here. Uh, pansy, pansy, pan, pansy sideways. That's an interesting name. I don't know if I should have read that out loud. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so I don't know what you guys heard, but I'll just say um, people look at Abraham as, am I glitching? Katie, am I still glitching? Yes, you have. I'm typically a silent watcher. Okay. Am I, okay. I'm going to ask it one more time. Am I glitching? No, I'm not glitching. Okay. Katie, it might be on your it might be on your end. Katie, maybe try leaving and then never coming back. No, I'm just totally kidding. Maybe try leaving and then coming back in. Um, no, I haven't glitched at all. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> not glitching. Okay. No flinching here. So, Robert. Um, stop now. Okay. Okay. We're going to dive in. We're going to go for it. And if you start, if I start glitching, it might be on your end, maybe try leaving and coming back or something. Okay. So we're talking about Abraham and you need to understand who Abraham is to the Jewish people because Abraham is everything to the Jewish people. That's why Paul brings Abraham up all the time. He always brings up Abraham, but we need to understand, um, a little bit of, uh, like since the Jewish people like highly, highly revere Abraham as the top dog, as like, like that's as high as holy as you can get almost. It's good to understand that Abraham had some questionable ethical decision-making process back during his time. And what I mean by that is uh, let's go to Genesis chapter 12 to like, let's see some of these things because 
it's good to, to humanize Abraham um, because the Jewish people tend to not remember, to, tend to forget to do that. Um, so let's go to Genesis chapter 12, verse 10. And in Genesis chapter 12, verse 10, uh, this is talking about Abram. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 10, it says, Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass, when he was close to entering Egypt, that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you, that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. So it was when Abraham came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abraham well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abraham, Abraham and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him. And they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. My point here in bringing this up is to get you to see that Abraham, Abraham was not a perfect guy. This guy was not good, like on all accounts, as by any means. And he lied here. Now, this is what you and I would label as a little white lie, um, in a sense, because he was doing something that was going to protect him and he was worried about his life. So you can be like, oh, OK, I can see why he might have done that. You, you start justifying this type of thing. But the, the moral of the story is, is that this was not OK. And it's clearly not OK because God intervened by plaguing Pharaoh. And so all of a sudden, Pharaoh is like, what the heck's happening here? Because he was about to take Sarai for his wife because he was he was he 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 was under the wrong pretenses and so he's looking at Sarai as um Abraham's sister which she was actually i mean Sarai was Abraham's half sister okay so it was just um they had the same father they just had different mothers and so they were brother and half sister but it's interesting they were married and uh, Abraham lied about it and so he lied about it to Pharaoh and it's interesting because when you look at Pharaoh and what he did, he ends up giving Abraham an ethical kind of class of sorts. He ends up telling Abraham, he's like, you shouldn't have done that. This is why you shouldn't have done that. Now get out of here. He's like, so it's interesting because Abraham, who is the father of the faith, right, is now getting an ethical history, like lesson from uh, an, a, a pagan Pharaoh, right? And so it's an interesting thing when you start paying attention. My whole point in bringing this up is to get you to see that Abraham was not perfect. And he actually ends up doing the same thing in Genesis chapter 20. So he, so uh, eight chapters later, he does the same thing in Genesis chapter 20. So that's the whole point. That's what I want you to understand. So Abraham made some very uh, questionable ethical decisions, if you will. Okay, so Rom Romans chapter 4, verse 1, it says, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? Verse 2, it says, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. It's interesting that it says, but not before God, because what this is implying in verse 2, it says, for if, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. And what you could almost imply that's being talked about here, where it says he has something to boast about, you could it could say he has something to boast about before men, but then but not before God. Right. And so that's the whole point. That's what that's what's left out here. Almost. It's, it says he has something to boast about before men, but not before God. That's the idea, because it says he has something to boast about, but not before God, which is the only thing that actually matters. It's not about what you think about me. It's not what about I think about you. It's what is going on between you and the Lord. So um, this is where we get into this very interesting situation because this is uh, Paul is talking to the Romans, right? R remember this, this, this letter is written to the 
people who are saved in Rome. But he's talking. Um, we need to. We. It, it's good to know that the rabbis during this time that the rabbis taught Abraham had built up so much merit from his works, and that that was available to his descendants. So they they had the idea that it, there was justification by their works, and so they they saw that Abraham did certain things, and they were confusing everything, and they thought that it was justification by works. But it's not by works. Justification is not by works. Justification is by faith. And so we're going to talk about the comparison of Romans to the book of James, because if you remember the book of James, it James talks about how you are justified by your works. Right. And so that's what, so we're going to talk about that here in a little bit, because some people say that the book of Romans and the book of James contradict each other. And so I will argue that completely differently. And I will tell you why here in a second. But before we do, I want you to understand that we just we just um, we're talking about Abraham here. Abraham is the Jew. Abraham is the father of the Jewish people. And he is brought about. He and so the so um, in verse three, um, Romans chapter four, verse three, it says, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. OK, so before we move any further, I kind of want to re. Um, if you guys were here for our study of Acts, this will be just like a little bit of a review, but go to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15 is a very important chapter in the book of Acts. And the reason why it's important is because you get a, you get a lot of insight on how a Jewish mind thinks. And what I mean by that is that there's the Jewish people during the time that, okay, so remember in the book of Acts, the church was a brand new concept. It was brand spanking new. In our world right now, in our American mind, we don't even think much of it. Like you could just drive down Park Avenue and just there's 50 churches that you pass, right? It's nothing new. The Holy Spirit is here and we've almost lost how amazing that is. Um, but during this time, the Holy Spirit was new. He was here in a completely different way. And this was still something that everybody was still trying to wrap their minds around. So in Acts chapter 15, this chapter shines a light on how the Jewish mind thought. And they were worried about how the, they were trying to figure out how to handle the Gentiles. Because they're like, hey, we're Christians, or we believe in Jesus, and we have the Holy Spirit. Um, but what are the laws for the Gentiles? Are the Gentiles still under the law? And so that's what Acts chapter 15 talks about. So in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, it says this. In Acts 15, verse 1, it says, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so that's what they were teaching everybody. That's what they. That's the idea that they had. So the the, the argument on the table was that, Unless you're circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. So that is what they were thinking of. Circumcision, circumcision, circumcision. So keep that in mind. Now, I don't mean to, or I, I guess I don't need to read all of this, um, but I can give you a little play-by-play. -play. Um, actually, let's read a couple verses. Acts chapter 15, verse 2. It says, Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputed with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders. And they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Okay, now this is where the, the circumcision is such a big thing in the Jewish mind. This, this is like one big massive picture, and it's important to understand it because of, you know, it, it will allow you to view things on uh, from a Jewish point of view. And what I mean by that is here in Acts chapter 15, these very highly intelligent people, highly, highly, highly intelligent people, very experts, they're like high experts in, their, in the law and whatnot, are making an argument. And so what I want you to understand here is that there's people in our there are people in our world right now who are very 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 highly intelligent who are also wrong. 
So note that because that's a, it's good to compare and contrast that. There are highly el uh, intelligent people in Acts 15 who are making an argument, but they're incorrect. And in our world today, there are highly intelligent people who are making other arguments about, is the Bible really true? Or is this book taken out? Or should it say this? Or this is wrong? Or this never actually happened? Or they added this and all these things. And so you're, you, st you tend to put your faith in some human being that you can see who has a title. Like a, like a PhD or a doctorate or something like that. And they're, they, they use really big words that you don't understand. And so now all of a sudden you're confused and then you start getting, you start doubting whether this is real and there's a little doubt that's planted in your mind and then you run with it. And then you, because you saw a TikTok video or something like that. And my point is be very, very careful of what's going on in our world right now, because this, the, the devil, your adversary, the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're susceptible to, you know, these attacks. You are even more susceptible in some cases because you are more of a threat. If you are living in sin and you're not a Christian, then he's he's just going to let you have whatever you want. He's just like, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, Bridget. He's going to let you keep doing what you're doing. And he's not going to think that I need to go after you because you're not actually actively working against him. You're working with him. And so if you're a Christian, now you're, you, you're painting more of a target on your back. My point is, is to be very mindful of what's going on in our world because there's smart people on both sides of the fence and you need to, you need to be cautious. Don't just, you need, that's why Acts 1711 is so important that they receive the word with all readiness and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things are so. Don't listen to me because I'm telling you something. Listen to what the Bible says and apply to what I'm saying. And then test these things, test these things, test these things. Okay, Acts chapter 15. The idea here is that they wanted people to get circumcised because that's what they were trying, that's how they were born and raised to think that way be under the law. They're like, hey, these people need to be under the law. And um, in order to be saved, they need to be circumcised. So that's why he's trying to get them. He's trying to push circumcision on Gentiles. And so anyways, long story short, James ends up stand or uh, Peter stands up and he's like, guys, don't you remember when Cornelius, he's like Cornelius in a couple chapters ago, Cornelius ended up getting saved and he never got circumcised and he received the Holy Spirit. And he's like, so the long story short is they don't need to get circumcised guys. Why do you want to put the Gentiles under the law to which you and I could not even uphold ourselves? And so let's go to Acts chapter 15, verse 11. In Acts chapter 15, verse 11, it says, um, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. And so what I want you to understand here is in verse 11, it says we, referring to the Jews, because this is this is Peter talking. Peter was a Jew. Peter says that we, the Jews, shall be saved in the same manner as the Gentiles. And so it's an interesting thing to pay attention to as far as the order of operations. What I mean by that is that he does not say that the Gentiles shall be saved at the same manner as us. He says that the Jews will be saved at the same manner as the Gentiles. And so you're starting to see this, this whole idea of the, um, that the Gentiles don't need to be under the law. Circumcision doesn't, is not applicable to the Gentiles. And that is what the entire uh, case is being made here. And this was a whole new concept. Now, obviously, there's a whole bunch of other stuff here that goes on in this chapter. This chapter is massive for the uh, Jewish mind. But just note that, uh, just remember that Abraham um, is what is we're talking about here in Romans chapter four. Um, Abraham is being talked about in Romans chapter four, and he is what is happening here? My goodness. Um, oh, Mr. Ham Ham Hamadi, I don't know why you keep asking. Um, okay, sorry, this box kept popping up. Okay, um, so Romans chapter four. He's talking about Abraham. He's talking about circumcision. And um, we need to understand that. Let's go to Acts chapter 7. I think, yeah, go to Acts chapter 7. Because this is a way to remember. So in Acts chapter 7. Okay, in Acts chapter 7, talking about Abraham still. In Acts chapter 7, verse 4. 
it says this in Acts chapter 7, verse 4. It says, Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. Now, this is talking about Abraham again. Keep that in mind. This is this is Stephen. Stephen is standing before the Sanhedrin right before Stephen gets, gets stoned to death. And he is trying to make his case on all, all of these examples of the past of the, the Jewish history. And he, he starts off by talking about Abraham. And so what I'm talking about in Acts chapter 7, verse 4, it says, Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when he his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. Now, this doesn't seem like that big of a deal because you don't understand the entire uh, backstory of the entire thing. But the whole point that Stephen was talking about in Acts chapter 7, verse 4, was that Abraham didn't listen right away. Abraham was told what to do, and he didn't listen right away. How do you know that? Let's go to Genesis uh, Genesis 15, I think. Genesis 15. Or wait, maybe 12. Nope, Genesis 12. Go to Gen Genesis 12. Genesis 12. Yep. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now, this chapter right here is what the like where we believe this is one of the reasons why we believe that America, why America is prospering as much as it is, because this is where it says, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. That's what it says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Um, so we are blessing Israel and we have been allies with them and we've been helping them and protecting them. But in our world today, you're seeing our hand being lifted off of Israel and we're almost pressuring them to stop the conflict and stop get a ceasefire and all these things. <coughs> and we're not providing them with weaponry and whatnot. Anyways, what I'm my me relating to Acts chapter seven, verse four, when what we just read in Acts chapter seven, verse four, when Stephen was standing before the Sanhedrin, it, um, you need to understand that Abraham didn't listen right away because, it, because you pick up on that in Genesis chapter 12. Because in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says, now the Lord had said to Abraham. Okay, so he had said it, which means he said it in the past and he's remembering it. So he said, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. So it says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, now the Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house. Now we know from Acts chapter seven, verse four, that he waited until his father died in order to do the things that he was required to do. So my point is, is that Acts chapter seven, Stephen was giving the Sanhedrin a history lesson. And he's like, listen, he didn't listen right away, but then he did. And then that's the, that's the whole pattern that's going on all throughout Acts chapter seven. So um, moving uh, bringing that in, back into play, um, th it's important to understand. We also talked about Genesis chapter 15. Uh, we talked about this earlier, but now that we're actually here in Romans chapter 4, go to Genesis chapter 15, and we're going to reiterate what we talked about a little bit ago, but in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Genesis 15, 6, it says, and he believed the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. He accounted it to him for righteousness. We talked about this before, but just in case you missed it. Abraham believed the Lord and God accounted it to him for righteousness. So again, remember that this all happened before the law was even given to us. It was before the law was given to us. And it was also two chapters before circumcision even occurred. Okay, so keep that in mind, and now let's go back to Romans chapter uh, 4. So in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, Romans chapter 4, verse 3, it says, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, when it says Abraham believed God, and it was accounted, what is it? What is it? Romans 4, verse 3, it says, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It is referring to his belief. So again, we're talking about his belief. This is all about Abraham. He's pitching this to um, these Jewish people. He's, he's bringing up Abraham because he understands that they can under, uh, they're, uh, he's, he's relating to them in this type of way. So he's going to be, he's talking about Abraham now. And so Abraham was before the law and before circumcision and he was saved by faith. And so that's what his whole point is 
that he's bringing to the table because he's going to contrast that with David because David was after the law and after circumcision. So you have Abraham over here who was before the law and before circumcision, and then he's going to bring up David who is after the law and after circumcision. So that's 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 where we're going here. So in verse uh, 4, Romans 4, 4, it says, Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Ooh, interesting. Romans 4, verse 4, it says, Now to him who works... The wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. So basically, this is saying is if you're working, what you get is wages. You're going to get debt. You're going to you're somebody's going to owe you a debt. If you're working, you're going to get owed a debt. But that's the opposite of what we should be doing. You, it's not by works. You don't get you don't get grace by works. You get your grace through faith. Okay, verse five. It says in verse five, it says, "But to him who does not work, but believes on him." Who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Man, kind of leaves you wondering if you get justified by works or by faith. I'm totally kidding. It is clearly by faith, not by works. This is getting just drilled in here. Um, okay, then we get to verse 6. And in Romans 4, verse 6, it says, Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Okay, so we, we're, we're transferring from Abraham, and now we are going to David. So um, David, is, David is under the law, but is still going to be saved by faith. Abraham was before the law and before circumcision, and Abraham was still saved by faith. David was after the law and after circumcision, and even though he was doing those things, he was saved by faith, not by the law. And then he gives us verse seven, and in uh, Romans verse four, verse seven is or chapter four, verse seven, it says, "Blessed are those who whose lawless deeds are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin." So this is quoting Psalm chapter thirty-two. So let's go to Psalm 32 real fast. And let's talk about Psalm chapter 32. In Psalm chapter 32, um, verse 1, Psalm chapter 32, verse 1 and 2, this is what this is what he's quoting. So Paul is quoting, now if you've been paying attention, in Romans chapter 3 and in Romans chapter 4 so far, he has been quoting a ton from the, the book of Psalms. He's, he's quoting David left and right. Right. And so this that's interesting that when you when you start paying attention to it and this is going to this going to um, become more clear as to why. But in Psalm chapter tw- uh, 32, verse one, it says, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Verse two, blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now, there's a lot of words in here that are very interesting, and I think we should take the time to talk about what these words mean. Because in verse 1, you have the word transgression. Then you have the word forgiven. And then you have the word sin. And then in verse 2, you have the word impute. And then you have the word iniquity. And then you have the word deceit or guile, your Bible might say. So you have words in here, and so let's let's talk a second. And let's actually define what these words mean. But in verse 1, it's starting off in the word transgression. The word transgression has the idea of crossing the line. So you're crossing crossing the line. Then you get to the word forgiven. And the word forgiven means to remove a burden. And so that's the idea behind the word forgiven. Then you have the word sin. The word sin is, it literally means missing the mark. So you're missing the mark. Whatever the mark is, you're missing the mark. You're, that's sin. The sin is to obey the law. You and I do not do that. We sin all the time. We miss the mark. So that is what sin is referring to. And then after the word sin, you have the word iniquity. And then the word iniquity literally means twisted. It's twisting. You're twisting things up. You know, the word sin and iniquity can be synonymous in some cases if you want to look at it that type of way. Um, but that's what the word uh, has. That's the definition of that word. And then you get to the word guile or deceit. And the word deceit or guile means it just means deception. 
And so then you have the word impute. And so the word impute is almost like an uh, like if you were an accountant, like if you were working on your taxes or something like that, um, you can look at it as an accountant type of perspective because it's it, it's you're 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 putting it you're you're putting whatever on somebody's account. And so that's what the word impute means. You're putting it on their account. Okay, so keeping that in mind, it says, blessed is he whose transgression when he crosses the line is forgiven, where he's re the burden is removed, whose sin, where they, where they miss the mark, is covered. Blessed is the man who the Lord does not impute or put on their account iniquity, which is sin or, you know, uh, being twisted. And it says, and in whose spirit there is no deceit or deception. So that's what... That's what he's talking about here. Now, what I want you to pay attention to now that we've labeled those things is in um, verse uh, uh, going back to Romans chapter four, verse uh, seven. The you need, you need to pay attention because in Romans chapter four, verse seven. These um, these verses teach that uh, teach justification apart from human merit, and this was going on back in the Old Testament. This is King David giving his words to you and I. And the idea that we are gleaning from this is that justification, that, 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 that justification happens apart from human deeds, from human works, from human merit. And that is clear in what we just read in Psalm chapter 32 or in Romans chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. That's the whole point. And that is from David. That is not from, you know, some Joe Schmo guy. This is from King of Israel guy. So David is providing a lot of insight. Okay, so now that we've covered those things, it's an interesting thing. So let's go to James chapter 2. Uh, and let's talk about James real quick. Um, in James chapter 2. So now we're going to flip gears a little bit and we're going to compare James to the book of Romans because there's some kind of, you know, some people say that James and Romans contradicts itself. But let's read James chapter 2, verse 14. Because we're talking about good works, right? So we're talking about how it's faith, uh, you know, for by grace are you saved through faith, right? Like it's all about through faith in Jesus Christ, like how works don't do anything for you. So keep that in mind, because that's what Romans is saying. Now let's read James chapter 2, verse 14. James chapter 2, verse 14. It says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister, sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them things which are needed for the body, what is a profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. For someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So what we've talked about before when we covered this, this is referring to dead faith. This is classified as somebody who has dead faith, where they say they do something, but there's nothing that backs it up. So that's, that would be classified as dead faith. So now we're getting to verse 19, and in verse 19 and 20, now we're going to be talking about the other type of faith, which is demonic faith. So in verse 19, it says, you believe that there is God, one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is, that faith without works is dead? So there's the demonic faith, and now we get to the dynamic faith, which is what you and I should strive for, because in verse 21, James chapter 2, verse 21, it says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac and his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works was made perfect? Now the word perfect there just means complete. It says in verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled, by, uh, fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Verse 24, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works 
is dead also. Now, this is an interesting thing because it says in verse 24, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Now, this it's important to understand the context, who everything is, who, who people, who, who the, the letter is intended for, who's writing the letter, the background, everything that's going on. The book of James is talking about justification before men. It's talking about being justified before men. So like if you look at me and you're judging me, you're seeing my good works and now I'm justified in your sight, right? So that's what's going on. In the book of Romans, Paul is writing that letter and he is talking about justification before God. So there's two different perspectives here. So James is talking about justification before men. Paul is talking about justification before God. So they're saying the same things in essence, but the idea here in the book of James is that if you have real faith, you demonstrate those, you demonstrate your faith by your works. Your works are going to be a testimony for what you believe in. So, so if you believe in Christ, if you believe in the Bible, if you believe what the Bible says, then you understand what you are being saved from and you understand who James was, what we talked about before. James was the half brother of Jesus Christ. Now, you and I, we like to think about Jesus and we think about how he only had the hard time where he was going through the crucifixion process. And that was him like actually like that was that was his struggles. Like the crucifixion was just his struggles. No, you need to remember that Jesus was born. He was a toddler. He was he grew up. He was four years old, six years old, eight years old. He was 12 years old. All of those years that you and I don't really get too much insight for. But those years still happen. So what you need to understand is that during those times, it was very, very frowned upon in Psalm 69 it talks about like if you if you look at it through that way it talks about him as a child and you understand the culture back in the old uh, 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 Mary for example it was so frowned upon in their Jewish culture on Mary being pregnant without having a husband like they looked at her and she was an outcast they looked at her with reproach it was a terrible thing like Mary how could you how could you and then when she has a child who they viewed as a bastard without a father and they look at Jesus and you forget about the upbringing of Jesus Jesus had a rough it was a you know it's like everybody was looking down on them every single word every place that they went to and um that was their culture. That's how they viewed things. And so when you understand that James was a half brother of Jesus Christ, and then you understand that James probably picked on Jesus the, his entire life, and he never looked at Jesus as the Messiah while they were growing up the entire time. And it wasn't until after Jesus died and rose again that James put his faith in Jesus Christ. Now you understand that James was looking at Jesus and he's like looking at him completely different, remembering how he treated Jesus throughout his entire life. And he's like, I can't believe that I did all those things to the creator of the universe. He's like, that's who I was rejecting my entire life. But now I look at him in a completely different way. And now I want to demonstrate why I believe and like that's who I was rejecting my entire life, but now I look at him in a completely different way. And now I want to demonstrate why I believe in. Sorry. Can you guys hear me? Hello. Can you guys see me? you guys there? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Sorry. Um, I, uh, I was getting a call, but so, um, my point is, is that people look at the book of Romans, they look at the book of James, and they say that they contradict each other. But you need to understand what was going on in the mind of James, who he was, how he viewed Jesus his entire life until after Jesus died on the cross and then rose again. This whole concept of how people were thinking and their mind space, like where they were in their minds, their mindset is important to understand so that you can grasp the, the where they're coming from. Like if I write you a letter and you have no idea my background or my history or what I've been through or anything like that, then you're going to view it in a certain kind of way. But if you understand where I'm coming from, then you can relate in a different way. You can be more empathetic and then things are going to click differently with you when you start to read the words that are written down in the page. And that's why it's important to understand. James, um, James here was trying to 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 just come he was just so committed to demonstrate his faith by his works and so that's why he's writing to this type of way you are not justified by your works you're justified by faith through christ alone but your works are a natural byproduct of your faith 
And so some people just have a hard time in the book of uh, Romans and they say that they, the two contradict one another, but they do not. Okay, so that is what is going on. What's up, DJ Nick? Yes, you are back. I am back. You're front too. That's off of Aladdin, I think. Um, Al, you're back. You're front too. Okay, so moving back to Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter 4, verse 9. Romans chapter 4, verse 9, it says this. Now in Romans chapter 4, verse 9, we're going to talk, start talking about justification, how justification is apart from the ordinances that were back in back in, their, in the Old Testament time period. In Romans chapter 4, verse 9, it says this. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that the faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised, not while uncircum, not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. So he is driving point, driving home the point that he was that faith uh, that uh, um, that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness while he was uncircumcised, which means that uncir the, the circumcision doesn't complete anything for these people. They were The circumcision was just what they were told. That was a way of relating. Those were for a sign to relate uh, to, uh, for the Jewish people. Um, but he was, uh, the faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness, and that all occurred while he was uncircumcised, before he was circumcised, which is interesting because when he became circumcised, you can make an argument that that's when he was the Jew. That's when he became the first Jew when he became circumcised. That's like everybody who was circumcised during that period, you know, if you were a proselyte or whatever, if you wanted to come convert over to the Jewish world, then you could choose to become circumcised to relate more with them. And that was just a statue. That's not what saved you, but that was just how you related with that type of people. So verse 11, it says, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. So imputed, here's this word imputed again. Now we were talking about this before. Imputed means to add to your account. So it says at the end of verse 11, it says that the righteousness might be added to their account also. That's, es that's essentially what the idea here. I need you to understand Righteousness, righteousness being imputed to your account. Wow, that's mind blowing. Righteousness added to your account, man. What? And it's freely. It's a free gift. That's what. That's what's mind blowing about the entire thing. Okay. Um. So Abraham is the topic of. It, we we move from Abraham to David, and now we're back to Abraham. Um, but Abraham here is, he's the father of the faithful. And so we need to understand it's the father of the faithful, not the father of just the Jews. He's the father of the faithful. And that's an important thing to understand because he's the father of all. So you are not circumcised or you might be circumcised, like, you know, whatever, uh, as, as far as the uncircumcised or circumcised go. But it doesn't matter whether you're, you're circumcised or uncircumcised. He's the father of the faith because he was justified by faith before he became circumcised. So the Jews look at Father Abraham as the father of the Jews. However, Paul's making the, 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 the stance here that he's the father of the faithful, not just the Jews. He's the father of the faithful, which means the people who put their faith in Christ. So I hope you guys are understanding this whole circular uh, uh, reasoning that he's using here, because the Jewish mind is looking at circumcision, circumcision, circumcision. However, um, so so um, he's so Father Abraham is he's the father to the faithful, not just the Jewish people, not just to the circumcised. He's also the father to the cir the uncircumcised who have faith in Christ alone. So that's the idea. So in verse 12, it says, and the father of circumcision to those who are not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. So everything that happened, Abraham was saved before the circum before he was circumcised. Abraham was saved before the law came. And that's the argument that Paul is making here. So he's trying to get it through these people's minds 
on how the circumcision is not, uh, it's not, it's not the end all be all. You're not justified by works, which is what circumcision is, is, is why they're making such a big deal here. Um, so Paul, so what Paul basically did here in these couple verses here is Paul basically turned the Jews, what they were boasting on. They were, the Jews were boasting on father Abraham, how father Abraham was their father. And he's like, Oh, look at father Abraham. So Paul, Paul is turning that upside down and he's saying it's, it's the Jew who must come to the, to a Gentile faith because, um, that's what was going on in, uh, Acts chapter, um, 15. That's what we were talking about in Acts chapter 15. How, because, uh, the way Peter was, Peter worded the entire thing was how he said that the Jews must need, need to be more like the Gentiles instead of saying that the Gentiles need to be more like the Jews. So, um, the Gentiles are basically like the, the Jewish people are blind in part. And so that's, so if you remember in Luke 19, when Jesus showed up on the donkey, he, the, the, Israel missed the time of their visitation, right? And so they missed the time of their visitation. So they were blind in part. That's what Romans chapter 11 is referring to Romans eleven twenty five. 25. The Jewish people are blind in part until the fullness of the Gentiles. The fullness of the de- de- Gentiles is different from the times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles started with uh, King Nebuchadnezzar and it's going to end uh, during when the, during the tribulation during with the Antichrist. The fullness of the Gentiles is when the church is being removed. And after the church is removed, then the eyes of the Jewish people are going to open up. And so they're, they're having a hard time with this. The, the, the Jewish people in general are struggling with this. And that's why they're still trying to obey the law. They obey the law, obey the law, obey the law. But they missed it. And so they're blind in part. And this is what's so interesting about our world today. Because many people in our world right now, if you were to take a poll, there's a lot of people who... Um, don't believe, I think it's like, like two out of five people, I think is the poll that I saw is either two out of five or three out of five people don't believe that the Holocaust actually happened. And this is very dangerous. This is very dangerous grounds to, uh, to, to kind of, to, to think about, because if, if those polls are accurate or two out of five or three out of five people don't believe that the Holocaust happened, then those, some of those people go to church. Some of those people are involved in church. And if they don't believe the Holocaust happened, that's leaving the door open for the history to repeat itself. And that's why it's so important to pay attention to the people who are controlling our textbooks and people who are monitoring and letting you into the history of, you know, our past history, because the one thing that we learn from history is that we never learn from history. And so history is going to repeat itself. And so that is going to actually happen again, because if you go to Zechariah, if you guys want to go to Zechariah real fast, Zechariah chapter uh, 13 in Zechariah chapter 13, verse eight, it's very interesting um, because speaking of the Holocaust, like it's going to happen again. Like we've like the Holocaust happened where it was one out of every three Jews were killed during the Holocaust. And that's terrible. But in Zechariah 13, verse eight, the Bible says that this is going to occur again. And it's terrifying. But in Zechariah 13, verse eight, it says, and it shall come to pass. And all the land, says the Lord, that two thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one third shall be left in it. I will bring the one third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. This is going to be this is talking about during the tribulation because it's all about Israel. It's always been about Israel. Look over at since you're in Zechariah, look at Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Uh, says this in Zechariah 12, 10, it says, and I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He's pouring out on the house of David. This is talking about Jewish people. It says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me, Jesus Christ, whom they pierced. They will, yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. This is all talking about Israel. Everything is about Israel. That's why Daniel 9, chapter 24 is so important. If you guys want to turn there real fast, just to remind you as to who we are dealing with, because we need to remember that Israel and the church are two separate things. There's the replacement theology where people talk about this type of stuff, and you need to be very mindful of this and to not buy into it because it's heresy. Nine, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 It says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. 
your people and your holy city. Who is Daniel? Hey, thanks, Melissa. Daniel is a Jew. He this is this is Gabriel talking to Daniel. Gabriel, the angel, talking to a Jew. He's saying in verse 24, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. This book, the book of Daniel, was written in two different languages. It was written in Aramaic and uh, uh, Hebrew. This part, Daniel chapter 9, was written in Hebrew. Um, half of the book is written in Aramaic. Half of the book is written in Hebrew. This this part, Daniel chapter 9, was written in Hebrew, which shows you if you were, if I was going to write a letter in English, you would know that the audience is for somebody English. If I was going to write in Spanish, you would know that it's for somebody who speaks Spanish. If I was going to write it in Hebrew, you would know that it's intended for a certain type of people. This book, Daniel chapter 9, is referring, it's important, it is being directed to the Jewish people, and it's backed up all throughout it, especially when you understand that it's split up in two different languages, Aramaic and Hebrew. It's important to understand and my point is, is that we're not learning from history. It's going to repeat itself. The Holocaust, the whole situation, in America, you know, two in five of people don't believe the Holocaust ever occurred. That's mind blowing. My point is you're starting to see anti-Semitism on the rise. It's going up all over the place. And now, like you're seeing from the Palestine to the sea, you know, whatever, they will be free. That The chant that they're saying. And it's 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 you're seeing the writing on the wall. And you need to know where we've been to know where we're going. And you need to not lose sight of this type of stuff. They're trying to switch things out. They're trying to brainwash people and make you doubt and make you question and make you think and make you go all over the place. That's why you need to know what you know and need to know why you know it. Anyways, going back to Romans chapter four, that was a long way about talking about something. I don't even remember what the conversation was. Okay. Uh, Romans chapter four, it says... In verse 13, it says, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So here, what we're going to be talking about here is justification, uh, how justification is apart from the law. He's just drilling this home. So in verse 14, it says, For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Ooh, ooh, very interesting, very interesting. I'll read that one again. Verse Romans 4, verse 14, it says, For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void. Void means empty, empty. Faith is made empty, and the promise is made of no effect. That's crazy. For if those who are of the law are heirs, so it's not about law. You need to understand that God does not need your good works. I just need, you need to understand that you think, and I think sometimes, sometimes we lose sight of things that we need to do good in order to maintain our salvation, or we need to do good to earn our salvation or whatever. But you and I both need to remember that God doesn't need those things. He's God, no matter what, he is going to be perfectly fine. We think that we're like, it's like, look at me and look at me and look at me. And we, we want everything to be about ourselves. That's wrong. We need to reprogram our minds to be like, no, we need to point everything to God. And that's why it's so important to think, learn how to think. It's not about you. It's not about me. We need to just like humble ourselves, man. We need to tremble before the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Like how many people, like there's so many people out there in the TikTok world and all the other social media parts and stuff like that who have this sense of arrogance when they start talking. And I'm just like, don't you, don't you rem remember who you're talking to? Like you are a soul talking to another soul, trying to reach them for Christ. You need to reach them with love. And there's the lack of love. There's a lack of humility. And we need to remember that God doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need these things, but he still chose to die for you. And it is through Christ alone, faith in Christ alone. It's not through works. If you start throwing works in there, then you are making God a liar. That's what 1 John 5.10 is talking about. You need to believe in what he said. And what he said is that the only way to salvation is through Christ and Christ alone. And that is what is going on here. So in Romans chapter 4, verse 15, it says, because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. In other words, it says the law keeps producing wrath. Like law is nothing. Law is there to shine a light on what you are being a sinner and whatnot. Like the law is there to show that you cannot m maintain justification. You are a sinner. That is what the law, the point of the law is. Verse 16, 
It says, therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So the father of us all, it's not just the father to the Jews. He's the father to the faith. He is the father to the faith because he's the one who had faith. He is, he believed God and it was accounted to him to, for righteousness. Now he believed God and he was saved before the works, right? Like, so that's, what's important. Like he believed God. It was about the faith in what he had to say or what he, what God told him. And he believed God. Um, Genesis 22, when Abraham and Isaac go up there, like he believed God, he put faith in God. He believed God. He's like, Hey God, I don't, if I, if I sacrifice my son, Isaac, like, it's not me who has a problem. It's you who have a problem because you promised me that I was going to have all these nations and like, I was going to populate the earth and, you know, all, you know, um, all the descendants of the, like the sand of the sea and whatnot. And so he believed God, he believed God, believed God, believed God. He put his faith in God. And that's the faith is what saved him. It was not the works. So moving on. It says in verse 17, it says, uh, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. This is quoting, this is being derived from Genesis chapter 17. Um, Genesis chapter 17, uh, verse 5. Because in Genesis chapter 17, verse 5, it says, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but you shall, your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. So he, that's what the, uh, that's what it's quoting there in verse 17. Uh, in Romans chapter 4, verse 17, continuing, it says, In the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Interesting. Calls those things which do not exist as though they did. <laughs> that's very funny. Um, God is the God of resurrection. God is the God of living. Verse 18, it says, who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so your descendants, or so shall your descendants be. Verse 19, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. I mean, that is just so cool. Like he, okay, just so just to get in the right mind space here, Abraham was fully convinced that God was able to perform the promises that, that God gave Abraham, fully convinced. You and I, are you and I fully convinced of the promises of God? Because there's some times where, you know, like some days you're just like, oh man, I really hope so, right? But are you fully convinced? Like, good morning, Sheesh. What's up, Tony? How are you doing? Um, it is very, very interesting paying attention to this type of stuff, giving glory to God and being fully convinced. Are you fully convinced? I mean, it's so crazy thinking about the faith that he had man fully convinced i mean there's so many promises you guys just got to surround yourself in the promises of this this the, the god's word i mean that's it it's a simple thing right like it's a simple thing to say but it's a difficult thing to do sometimes but you need to do it. you need to remember who you are number one like if you are a son of god you are a new creation just think about that for a second and just dwell there marinate in that and then go to the next one and then go to the next one go to the next one go to the next one if sons then heirs if heirs then you know if you're an heir man unpack those words think about those words look up the definitions to those words and then just be like holy crap like that's me that's me that's me are you serious that's me oh that's me too like i'm a king and a priest are you kidding me what did i do to deserve this the answer is nothing he did it all you are putting your faith in what he did because he was enough verse 22 romans chapter 4 verse 22 it says and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness doesn't say anything about him actually doing anything right it was what he his faith where was his faith his faith was in what god said he believed god and it was counted to him for righteousness verse 23 it says now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him but also for us 
it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. Imputed. That word is so cool. Like, I need you just to think, like, he's putting it on your account. Like, we all, like, like if you were going to a restaurant or something like that and you bought, like, 50 cheeseburgers, like, you would owe $100 or whatever. And that's on your account. Like, hey, you owe $100. He is putting his righteousness on your account. That's fascinating. Because it was not for him or for them. It was also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. There goes Paul again talking about the resurrection. Can you believe it? The audacity. I'm just like, come on, Paul, let's talk about something else. No, I don't want to talk about anything else. Let's talk about the resurrection because that is so stinking cool. That is how we get to heaven. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 is where the gospel is. And it is talking about how Jesus was how he died, how he was buried, and how he rose again. That is the gospel. All right, moving on to verse 25. It says, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Justification, declared righteous, declared righteous. It's not a little slow process, like how you, you know, you, you, you marinate like some steak and you let it sit overnight and all little by little, it, it kind of, no, it's an all at once type of thing. When you are justified, it is a, an all at once type ordeal. It is a one and done situation. When you are justified, you are sealed. When you are sealed, you become a new creation. When you become a new creation, you are baptized uh, by the Holy Spirit. It's an all a one and done situation. It's a total package. And so that is what Paul is getting, trying to talk about here. And uh, that's what I got. That is Romans chapter three and four. So that was, uh, that was, uh, that was good. I enjoyed that. I, I hope you guys enjoyed it. <laughs> I had fun with that. Um, so that is some good stuff right there. Man, Romans, am I right? Ha, Katie. Um, great. Hey, Carla. Thank you. Oh, Holly. Sheesh. Holly coming out. Man, thank you, Holly. I appreciate that. Is DJ Nick still in the house? Sheesh, thank you. Yeah, Alex, for sure. Thanks for being here. Um, absolutely. Wendy, are you are you at work? Are you on like day three or day four? Holly, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Oh, man, Bridget. Happy New Year's. Blooming ribbons. That's cool. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bridget, you guys are too kind. Uh, you have no idea, my friend. <laughs> I don't. End it on fire. Start it on fire. You rock. Woo! Man, I'm telling you what, getting all kinds of pumped up. I'm telling, like, I mean, just, it's just so good. You know, like, you just start talking about it, and then you just get all fired up about all the other things that just come to mind, and you're just like, man, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and you just get, addiction is tough. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, Sorry. Yeah. DL productions. Um, yeah, no kidding, man. Uh, you'll be up all night. <laughs> What's up coffee. I'm always up all night. Day two. Oh no. One more night. Oof. Uh, please pray for me. I'm begging. Yeah. Shoot me a text or a message, man. If, uh, uh, on something, if you want to tell me specifically, uh, thank you, Jules. I appreciate that guys. You know that it's, I, you don't have to do those things. I never, never think that you should, but I know that you guys would like to. So I appreciate it. Just not needed at all. If you guys are also interested on going through these at like a slower pace and like trying to think about what, I, you know, what we said on here or whatever, um, you can go up here. Candace and Wendy, thank you guys so much. Wow. You guys are crazy. Um, thank you. But there's a YouTube uh, link in my TikTok profile. If you guys want to, I always upload these to YouTube. So if you want to go back and revisit them or whatever you can, I know I speak fast. Um, and I know that I personally learn better when I get to pause and play, pause and play, pause and play. I was driving today and I was, li I was listening to this book, uh, um, Yeshua, um, What's it called? I was listening to this book on tape written by this guy named Arnold Fruchtenbaum, and he's like this messianic Jew. And so anyways, my point is, is that like I really enjoy listening to those things because like, you gain a great perspective of how a Jewish person thinks. And then I go I always rewind like all the time. Like I hear something. I'm like, wait a second. And then I hit the go back 15 seconds button. 
and then I keep hitting it and I listen to it again. I listen to it again. I listen to it again. And I just like think about it for a second. And like, that's how I learn because if I hear one thing, like it's in one ear out the other, and then I don't get to think about it for a second and let it sink in. So that's how I, that's how I do. So if you guys are interested, you can go to YouTube. It's on my TikTok profile. There's like a little YouTube link. You can click there. And you know, if, if you're interested, you know, I, I, I you don't have to. <laughs> yeah. Thanks Ryan. I loved it. No problem, Bridget. Thank you for those gifts, Bridget. You guys are crazy. I don't like, um, blessing to us. Bless you back. Oh, thanks Katie. Um, Katie, you cracked me up. <laughs> I'm glad that you, you said Katie text, uh, messaged me on here and she said that she was watching Romans one and two. And she, she was like laughing because of something I said or whatever. And I was just like, yeah, I'm, I, uh, it, I, yeah, it's, 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 it, 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 I, 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 I'm a, I'm a child. Uh, I, I'm sure you guys can see that coming through on sometimes on some of the things they say, you guys have no idea how much I just hold back because like when I end this live, I just let it all rip. You know, I just, no, I'm totally kidding, man. Sheesh. I'm going to have to watch this video again, but on a slower speed. Yes. Oh, DJ Nick. Yes, I am Ryan. Great study tonight. Thanks DJ. Thanks for being here. Blondie. Thank you, Ryan, for being, oh man. Awesome. Blondie. Thank you. Um, but thank you guys for being here. Um, squirrel. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I want you guys to know more than anything, you guys can disagree with me on some of these things, but what I want you to know more than anything else is how to know for sure you can get to heaven. And that is through Christ and Christ alone. That's what I want you to know. That's it. Bottom line, Christ and Christ alone. It's not Christ and good works. It's not Christ and going to church. It's not Christ and getting baptized in a, a pond somewhere or something like that. It is through Christ putting your faith in what he did. Everything else is secondary. Everything else that comes after that is secondary. The water baptism is secondary. The good works that you do after that are secondary. When you tell somebody the gospel, that's secondary. When you get saved, when you get justified, that is when you're putting your faith in what Jesus did. And you're asking, you're putting your faith, you're fully relying on him. And that is how to know for sure that you are, um, how to know for sure you can get to heaven. That's what I want you to know more than anything else. Hey, hey Ryan, I read Psalm 109. Uh, eight and started laughing because I thought of Joe Biden. <laughs> yeah. um, is that that's uh, where it says uh, let no uh, he should leave his office or something about that? I think. Why do you call yourself Sheesh? Uh, I don't know. I I liked I thought I liked the name and every time somebody says the name Sheesh, they almost go up an octave and I just think that's kind of fun. Um. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Squirrel truly. I have a son who is pure squirrel. Love the energy for sure. Let's go. Hey, Katie, thanks for hanging out and staying up this late. I know that's pretty tough for you normal people, you normies out there, which what's what's normal life like? You'll have to tell me sometime. I like your childlike humor. You're so animated. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I love it, Ryan. Uh, can you please say the verses for the Romans Road again? Yeah, it starts in Romans 3.23. Romans 3.23 um, if somebody wants to write these in the comments, I can I can pin it later uh, just so everybody can write it down if you want. But it's Romans three twenty three, Romans six twenty three, Romans ten nine, and Romans five one. Those are that is uh, how you walk somebody through the quote unquote Romans road. Now you can add some other verses in there if you want to, but that's basically the gist of it. It gets it, it, you walk them to understanding that they're a sinner, and you get them to say or you get them to see that the wages of sin is death. And then you're like, well, that's not the end of it. And the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then you take them to Romans 10, 9. And then, you know, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe on him who raised him from the dead, you know, and then the Romans 5, 1 which ends on a promise. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so it's, it's just, it, Oh, you missed one. Did you miss one up, oh, up oh, like Romans three twenty three, Romans six twenty three, Romans 10, nine and Romans five, one. Uh, so it's all of those right there. Uh, just Romans five, one is, uh, the last one. Yeah. You're, yeah. No problem. Um, but that is what I got for you guys. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions. You are more than welcome to ask them. If you guys have any questions later on in your day-to-day -day life, you can feel free to shoot me a message here. Like, you don't have to follow me on here. My messages are open to anybody and everybody at all times. Um, if you guys do follow me, I do put out a little story um, to let you know when I do go live. Um, I try to do that a couple hours in advance. <clears throat> what is today? Um, today is Wednesday. Um Um, 
uh, Wednesday. Maybe third. I think I might be able to go live on Thursday. I think I'm third. I think I can go live on Thursday and maybe on Saturday. Can't remember. I think Thursday and Saturday. Um, thank you, Ryan. Uh, oh, so uh, thank you. Uh, God. Hey, thanks, Carla. I appreciate that. I really do. It's nice um, when you know tonight's study was awesome. Thanks again, right? Yeah, Blondie. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. DJ is doing well. Awesome. Candace coming in with the update. I appreciate that. That is so cool. Yeah. DJ cracks me up. She was talking all kinds of gibberish when she was high on Oxy or Percocet or whatever. <laughs> she had heart surgery, so she's taking some pain meds. <laughs> so she's not fully with it. So it's fun talking to her when she's just not thinking clearly. I get to ask her all kinds of questions and get her real thoughts. No, I'm totally kidding. She told me I missed that. LOL. How is Chris? Um, Chris um, sent me a message. Uh, I didn't read it before I came, uh, uh, started the live tonight because I was already like 12 minutes late. So I felt bad. So um, <clears throat> I think he said he was out of the hospital with the short few words that I could see before. You know, if you don't click on something, you can still see some of the words. I think he said he was out of the hospital. Um, but yeah, keep him on your, in your prayers too, with the whole cancer situation and his family. Cause that's, that's just a tough situation. So, uh, yeah, thanks Candace. Uh, she told me, um, I'm four minutes out from open heart. So I praying, uh, oh, you're four months out from open heart. Oh, you got it coming up here, mama, mama wolf. No way. Um, out from open heart so is that is that what you're saying you're having open heart yourself mama wolf or are you talking about deidre um man lots to pray about you know a lot of power and prayer it's good to pray um it's good to pray specifically um if you guys do pray keep those people in your prayers um you know because we all need it don't think that you're above you know somebody you know you're not, you, you, uh, don't think that <laughs> they're not worth your time praying for them because, you know, if you were in their shoes, you would love when somebody prays for you. And it's so cool if you look at it from a visual kind of stance and you try to imagine what prayers look like when they go from you up to before the Lord. And you, if you try to, you know, use an animation in a sense, like just so you can wrap your mind around it, like just set up like a laser beam, like a bright light, just going straight up into heaven, like going straight to God. And that is so cool. Like that's what we're doing. And like, we need to do that and we need to lift each other up. And, you know, as you go about your day, if you, if these people come to mind, pray for them. And I'm, I know that they would appreciate it. Um, a friend of mine is in the hospital <clears throat> for a heart attack. Shoosh. Um, well, um, yeah, lots to pray about, pray for our country. Pray for our soldiers, <laughs> pray for our leaders, man, pray for our leaders. Um, and uh, tell somebody about Jesus, guys. I want you guys to do that so badly. Uh, you have no idea. I think it's just the coolest thing in the world. I think it is the coolest thing in the world. Um, prayers are like incense going up to God. There you go. Cinderella. Um, yeah, like the, the, the altar of incense inside the tabernacle. Very true. Uh, prayers blanket with so many right now. Yes. Um, but thank you guys so much for being here. I'm going to, I'm going to log off here in a minute, but, um, if you guys have any questions about anything, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you're never going to bug me, bug me. I, I do my best to respond, um, as fast as possible. And, um, you don't have to follow me, uh, you to, in order to, um, send me a message, you can just do it, uh, whenever, if you, uh, want to. And, um, yeah, I upload these on YouTube. If you guys are interested, we went through the book of revelation, Daniel, Ruth, John, Hebrews, James, Acts. And now we're going through the book of Romans. All of those are up on YouTube. If you guys would like to go unpack those, cause those are some good studies. What? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, they, yeah, no problem guys. And, uh, tell somebody about Jesus. And if you do tell me that you told somebody about Jesus, because I love like that encourages me so much, like no joke. When people tell me that they had the opportunity to tell somebody the gospel, I'm just like, let's freak go. And then I feel like I got to one up you and then I got to get out there and I got to do it so I can tell you guys about it. And like, I'm like, <laughs> I haven't done it for a, a little bit, you know, aside from on here. But like, I'm talking like a one-on-one -on -one type of situation. You know, I say it all the time on here and I'm just not going to stop, but, um, whenever there's that opportunity, man, I'm telling you what, I'm, I'm gonna take it. 
So, um, good night, speedy sheesh. Okay. I'll talk about Jesus every day to a lot of people, but I don't want to boast about it. Oh, Karen, that is not boasting at all. I don't take that. You know, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in Jesus. And so that's what you're doing. And so if you do tell somebody about it, like tell people because that's encouraging them, right? Like, I'm not saying like, no, obviously you don't want to do it with like with your nose up in the air or anything like that. Obviously that's not the way that we should do it, but it's encouraging the body that somebody else is going out there and doing that type of stuff. So I, I don't know how you view, you, you guys view it, but I view it in nothing but encouragement because, you know, it's, you know, he must increase, you know, we must decrease and he gets, he gets, uh, <laughs> it's all about him. And so, you know, um, I don't, I, I, hopefully you guys aren't taking it that I'm boasting about like, look at me, I'm going around telling people about Jesus. No, I'm trying to encourage you guys to go do it. So hopefully it's not coming across the way. I don't think it is, but hopefully it's not because that's not my intent. And if it does, then I apologize. But, um, I also do think it's cool when people talk about telling others about Jesus, because if you're going to boast in anything, that's what you should be boasting about. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for correcting me. Oh yeah, Karen, for sure. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for being here. And, uh, maybe on Thursday we'll go again and hit up Romans chapter five and chapter six. And we are cruising right through this thing. But um, I wouldn't be here if I thought that. All right, Candace, cool. Um, you guys have a good night and um, stay safe and be a blessing. Be a light. Tell somebody about Jesus. All right, guys.